All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and begin this evening. All right, welcome to our special meeting of City Council tonight. We will be considering the recommendations of the Cleveland Avenue Task Force to create a Florida T intersection at Woodlawn Avenue and Capitol Trail. In addition, if Florida T is approved, we will then consider an additional recommendation to install a hawk signal for the new crosswalk at East Cleveland Avenue, just west of McKees Lane, with a, with a central pedestrian refuge island also for consideration. Prior to us beginning tonight, there are a few items I would like to share with you. In the case of an emergency, please note the exits out of this room, and they are located in the back left corner. The main entrance at Amy and the council table. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stand up as well. Can everybody hear me? Did everybody understand the exits out of the room? If not, please raise your hand. All right, the exits out of this room in case of an emergency are the entrance that you came in, the back left corner here, or your back right, and the exit here by Councilman Markham. Right, the restrooms are out the ent entrance area that you came in and to the right. This is considered a council meeting, so we will be following our rules of procedure. If you have not attended a council meeting before or in some time, we will have time for public comment tonight. Our order of business will be the following. We will have an introduction by our acting city manager, Tom Coleman. We will then have a presentation by DELDOT representatives who are here this evening. We will have council discussion in a round robin format. I will then open it up for public comment. It will then come back to the table here for council discussion and potential direction to staff and a vote on our agenda tonight. Uh, council, please keep in mind tonight I will be doing a roll, calling, roll call voting uh, for this evening. With regards to public comment, each speaker has three minutes to share their thoughts. I will not be extending any time tonight due to the large number of folks who would like to be heard. Renee Bensley will hold up a sign when you have 60 seconds left, and then again at 30 seconds. When a timer sounds, which I will make you aware of that, it might be hard to hear in here, your time has expired and you will be asked to have a seat. It is my understanding that there has been some discussions and a video shared prior to tonight's meeting by a former council member regarding seating time. Contrary to what has apparently been incorrectly shared earlier, seating time will be permitted. The person willing to seat time must be on the sign-up sheet and must be present to see time to another person. Please keep in mind that I expect the discussion to remain germane to the topic tonight, or you will be asked to have a seat. Also, please keep in mind that I expect everyone to be civil, to speak in turn, and be respectful of others. All right, we can go ahead and begin. Tom Coleman. Thank you, Polly. As uh, Polly mentioned, my name is Tom Coleman. I'm the acting city manager for the city of Newark. Since there are a lot of new faces in the audience, I thought it'd be appropriate to kind of go over the background of, of how we got to this recommendation, the process, and can you hear me now? Or, okay. Uh, the, the process of both what's been done and what the plan was to, to move forward. So uh, almost two years ago now, it might be two years ago now, 
the city was approached by DelDOT because Cleveland Avenue uh, was picked up in their hazard elimination program. I'm not gonna get into the specifics of what that is because DelDOT will do it better uh, in a few minutes. But the, the gist of it was that they're required to look at the, at the roadway to try to make safety improvements uh, for all road users, uh, vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, the whole lot. So uh, they had uh, tried and, and failed in the past to uh, get improvements to this corridor, so they felt the best approach would be to reach out to the city and have the city lead the effort um, of, I guess, determining the problems, uh, figuring out potential solutions, and then making a recommendation to our city council uh, that they would then be able to consider at a public meeting exactly like this uh, as to whether or not we move forward with the recommendations. So. Uh, they, uh, as, as I mentioned, Dallas reached out to the city. The city's traffic committee decided the most appropriate way would be to create a subcommittee of stakeholders uh, in the area. The original uh, goal of the project was Cleveland Avenue from New London Road all the way to Library Avenue. Uh, the subcommittee was made up of uh, appropriate staff members, uh, myself, Lieutenant Nelson, um, our planning department, uh, representatives from the community, both residents and business owners, and uh, representatives from organizations like NAACP. Um, over the course of 2016, we held uh, five different public meetings and a site visit to walk the street and see where the problems were and come up with uh, what the things were that we actually wanted to solve. Um, DelDOT did have a seat on the committee and they provided modeling assistance when we needed to have a traffic model done to see if we change this what happens to the traffic uh, to make sure safety improvements aren't ne uh, negatively affecting congestion uh, that much. So um, the task force did their work. We identified a, a suite of recommendations, um, all of which except uh, the two that are being considered tonight were previously approved by council uh, at a council meeting back in October. Um, so uh, at this point, I'll hand it over to Deldot, who will discuss the hazard elimination program and then get into the specifics of the Florida T, the modeling, some of the questions that we've received, uh, how we've incorporated feedback we've received up until this point into the potential design that's being considered by council this evening. So, uh, Mark. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try this mic. That one has some feedback. That's a little better. All right, so I can, yeah, good, applause already. I'll. I'll I'll trade this back and forth as, as needed. So um, thanks, Tom. My name is Mark Lutz. I'm the chief traffic engineer at uh, the Delaware Department of Transportation. Um, just uh, before we get started here, I'd like to thank the, uh, the city elected officials and staff and, and police who, uh, who we've worked very closely with, not just on this project, but uh, on, on any uh, traffic flow and safety and operational issues around the city. Uh, over the last few years, we've gotten a, a, a great working relationship with them to, to uh, make good upgrades uh, throughout the city. So I, I appreciate that. Um, just a little bit of a preview. I'm going to take a little, a little bit of time, and then I'm going to hand it off to Matt. Um, I'm a little, um, this, this presentation uh, is significantly more detailed than what we would normally do in this type of a forum. Uh, we have 62 slides, so if you didn't hear that, I broke up there, 62 slides. Um, the reason for that and, and the level of detail would normally be in a report that's probably this thick and probably none of you would ever read it, but is that we've just gotten so many comments and questions and concerns uh, on either side of this issue that uh, we've attempted to fairly review all of those concerns and we've tried to take all of them seriously and evaluate all of them. Uh, so that's that's uh, the reason if, if you're seeing things up here that you're saying, if you're seeing things up here and you're thinking, well, well why, why are they even looking at that? Well, it's because somebody asked the question. So we're, we're trying to look at all the different things that, that people brought up to us. Um, uh, I think with that, I'll get into it. So, uh, so Tom, Tom covered this a little bit. Uh, so the hazard elimination program is a federally required program that every state has to, uh, to do. It's an annual program where we review the crash data from the previous three years and we uh, 
we, we determine the, the roadways throughout the state that have the highest crash rates. Uh, and, when we, and then we look at those, uh, we look at how they're ranked, and then we, uh, then we study them and we make recommendations. And sometimes the recommendations can be as small as change some signs or some striping. There's more medium-sized projects uh, such as this. And then there's much larger projects that come out of this program, like a, a dualization of a roadway. Or uh, working on one in Dover right now, where we're going to widen Route 13 from two lanes in each direction to three. So you, you can get from very small to very large. Uh, we also have folks from various agencies and police and others. There could be enforcement recommendations that come out of it. There could be a, a variety of recommendations that come out of this program. So with that, if I can get this going, and I hit the wrong button apparently. There we go, just a little bit of an intro. So in, uh, back in 2015, when we ran the numbers and we looked throughout the state at all the different corridors, uh, two corridors in Newark came up. Uh, <coughs> one was North College Avenue, uh, which you see some data there, and you can, if you can see the map. And again, the, the details aren't all that important. Um, uh, was was considered site J in our in our program, and uh, then Cleveland Avenue was uh, ranked as site P site P in our program that year. So, so that was in 2015. Uh, you know, we had as you can just see from the letters, we had you know sites A, B, C. We had a whole bunch of other sites that year. We did all our work. You know, did did various recommendations on those, but the ones that were critical for for what we're talking about here. Were, were Site P and Site J. And as Tom mentioned, uh, there's some of these we will go through and make our own recommendations and we'll implement them ourselves. Uh, in this case, because we were in the city of Newark and there had been uh, previous iterations of trying to make some of these improvements that ultimately were not approved, uh, we thought it was a better idea to, to work with the city, to work with the local planning agency, which is called WOMAPCO, the Wilmington Area Planning Organization. And uh, we worked with them, and then they uh, <coughs> developed the committee that uh, Tom talked about. The committee made the recommendations, the, the city traffic committee made the recommendations, and now it's on city council's agenda. Uh, the last point I want to say before I hand it back, uh, no, one more slide. Uh, so the, over the years, there's some of the relevant HEP sites that have been uh, in this area uh, are listed. I'm not going to go through all of them other than, again, back in 2005, there were similar discussions, but they didn't really go anywhere. Uh, in 2012, the recommendations that ultimately led to what is currently operating at the intersection, um, that's when those, those ideas came up, were designed, we worked with the city, the city approved it at the time, and it was implemented, and that's the 2012 is what resulted in the current intersection configuration. And then in 2015, we talked about that. Currently, the, particularly on Cleveland Avenue, uh, this, this information or the data there called the critical ratio, uh, I, I know you don't know what that means, but 4.3 means that it's roughly, it's a statistical measure, but it roughly means that the crash rate on Cleveland Avenue is four times worse than the Av statewide average of that type of roadway. <clears throat> so with that, I think I will uh, hand it over to uh, Matt Buckley, who is our uh, project manager for this, uh, for this project. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting the council. All right, let's get started. So the middle portion of this presentation the middle portion of this presentation has a lot of information that's comparable to the previous meeting in March. This information here is new and we thought we would begin by highlighting the crashes all along the corridor and particularly at the intersection. So as Mark alluded to, the prior condition at Woodlawn and Cleveland Avenue and Capitol Trail had a T-bone crash problem that in terms of the HEP we identified that in 2012. That was our focus time was to target those T-bone left turn crashes. In May of 2015, we implemented what is currently in place with the exception of the double left on Woodlawn Avenue. That is after period one. 
The T-bone crashes along Capitol Trail diminished, thankfully. But we've had other crash clusters somewhat develop faster than anticipated. Namely, the crash pattern at the bottom, which is the right turn coming off of Cleveland Avenue versus a left turn leaving your neighborhood. We then looked at the data after we put in the double left. So that's been in place for about a year. We still have a similar crash pattern out there. So this just gives a snapshot as to what has gone on at, that, at Cleveland Avenue, Woodlawn Avenue, and Capitol Trail since we've been looking at this more extensively since about 2012's program. We also wanted to highlight what is going on along the corridor between Woodlawn Avenue and Anna Way. We're calling this the mid-block section. It's the unsignalized portion of Capitol Trail between the two traffic signals. Along that stretch, with, between 2012 and 2017, so a substantial amount of time, there aren't many red flags that would indicate right now that there's a crash problem on that stretch. With respect to the driveway crashes, there are only two crashes reported in that period. However, they did not actually involve vehicles that were turning into or out of the driveway. It was like a secondary rear end crash. Meaning if Michelle turned into her driveway, I was following Michelle, Mark was following me, Mark runs into me, they're unscathed. So that's what was reported in the crash reports. Again, this is all reported crash data. So if a crash goes unreported, we don't have the means of summarizing and looking into that data. We also wanted to look at the corridor as a whole. We wanted to go all the way back upstream of Capitol Trail and Cleveland Avenue and look and see what's going along on along the segment of Library Avenue into Capitol Trail. So here, these are crashes from 2012 up through arguably the present of October of 2017. And as you can see, which isn't really a surprise, is the bulk of the crashes on the corridor are between Wyoming Avenue, or Wyoming Road, sorry, and Cleveland Avenue. We then have a significant reduction in the mid-block section, and then we'll get to, up to Anna Way. Again, there's a significantly less amount of crashes at the Anna Way traffic signal. We love to look at data and numbers, so then we started, okay, what time of day do these crashes generally occur? Again, this is a trend that is not all that surprising for a corridor with these characteristics. The flare-ups begin in the morning, and then the main flare-up is during the evening rush hour. What this is indicative of, this trend, is that you know, we have congestion-related crashes along the corridor. As traffic picks up, congestion picks up, we have trap trends that are very comparable to congested corridors. Again, this is from Wyoming up to Cleveland. Continuing on, days a week. Some people have asked us what happens on the weekend, what happens on the weekdays. We looked into that. Not surprising here. Weekday crash patterns are prevalent than the weekends. Month of year. Not a surprise here. There's a big university. Ticks down in the summer ticks down during winter break, and then it picks up. This one here was um, where we dug in a little bit deeper, and you know, anecdotally, we think we understand why this may occur. Uh, this is crashes based on type over the years. So what we've seen here is it was more or less steady between 2012 and 2015. We had an overall increase in crashes in 2016 and now 2017 to date, and really the, the highest trend in terms of the increase has been rear end crashes. Again, a characteristic of a congested corridor, congestion related crashes. We're also seeing an uptick in angle crashes. 2015, you could say it was a blip and angle crashes down, but angle crashes are now a tick back up. So that was a summary of safety concerns along the corridor from Wyoming up through Anaway from a crash data standpoint that's reported. And as Mark led off the presentation, the corridor as a whole stands out among its peers statewide as having a crash rate that's higher than average. The bulk of this information in these following slides, probably next 20 to 30 slides, is very similar to the March presentation. 
just want to walk through it. Rather, we have a lot of slides tonight, so I'll go through briskly. All right, in terms of the Florida E concept, what will happen to the intersection delay? This is average delay for every vehicle on the three approaches. Morning, we'll see a significant reduction of 40 seconds. The biggest gain is obviously in the PM where the, the crash numbers are significantly high. These are the delays just at this intersection. In the morning, left turn onto Cleveland Avenue, significant gain. When we see a number of 114 seconds and we're running 120 second cycle length out there, we know that we have people that are waiting two, three cycles. These are just average delays. So again, we're gonna get it down to a much more reasonable level expected from a you know, level of service patient standpoint. In the evening, right now, we're looking at you know, reducing that nearly half. Northbound through in the morning, this is obviously the lane that we'll see predominantly green. The only time they would face a red is when a pedestrian, when a pedestrian activates the pedestrian signal phase to cross from the refuge island over to the corner. If I'm going too fast, let me know, please. In the evening, here where we see the most bang for the buck associated with making a more free flow movement out of the city. We'll see right now, just at this intersection alone, we see cycle failures of two to three cycles. And what happens there is that the fact that you can't get through this signal, your queue and your delay arguably spills back down the corridor. So although Delaware Avenue and Wyoming Road and even Main Street, they have delays, isolated delays in themselves that are somewhat reasonable, the snowball effect that comes back along that northbound approach is a result of this 199 seconds. So this is where we'll see substantial gains. From our modeling efforts, we look at travel times right now in the 20 to almost 30 minutes coming up the corridor at certain times, and we're gonna see numbers that are probably anywhere from seven to 10 minutes less in terms of travel time going from Wyoming up through Cleveland Avenue. The gains aren't just in the northbound direction. In the morning, you'll see a slight benefit coming through on southbound, and in the evening, same thing. You'll see a slight benefit. Of all the approaches right now, this is arguably the one that does not suffer as much as the other approaches. Cleveland Avenue, the impacts or the, or the benefits of going to a Florida state are pretty remarkable to how we'll be able to clear left turn traffic off of Cleveland Avenue. We'll see a gain of over 100 seconds in the morning and nearly 200 seconds in the afternoon. So when you look at the the big picture package that, we, that Tom talked about in terms of the, all the Cleveland Avenue task force recommendations, 200 seconds goes well beyond Paper Mill Road in terms of the influence of the benefit. So we'll see a 200 second gain here. When you unkink the end of that hose, it'll free flow traffic, you know, ar arguably all the way back west of the road. Unfortunately, in public service and engineering, civil service, things come to cost. It's a double-edged sword. So will this Florida T inconvenience some people? Yes, we don't dispute that. If you live on the north side of Route 2, you'll have to divert down to the 273 intersection to make a U-turn. Fortunately, those people that are north of 2, west of Anna Way, there's not that many trips that are making that U-turn in terms of the traffic. Anybody, anybody that's on the south side, they'll still have options to come through and make right turns to get back to their parcels along the south side of Capitol Trail. We look at that movement as to, you know, obviously the corridor has several tight spots where it's very difficult to make a U-turn begins all up at Anna Bay, and the one we highlighted and that we wanted to look at closely was what happens to that southbound U-turning traffic. What we're showing here is the turning path of a passenger car. It indicates that we need to pull back this concrete 
Island. Same thing with one of Aetna's ambulances. We'll need to pull, back. We'll need to pull back the island. It's something that be obviously done in advance of any construction of the floor. So where does the traffic go and what happens to animals? In the morning, what we're anticipating is a version of over 100 vehicles to make a left turn out of Annaway. The timings that we have in place right now at Annaway are up. It's up. We run a 60 second, a one minute cycle length, half the time of the big intersection down at Cleveland Ave, and we give a third that time to Annaway. What these results show is that even with the the results show that even with the diverted traffic, the timings that we have in place don't need to be tweaked that much because we have capacity. We were able to give you more green time at Anna Way, substantially more than at Woodlawn Avenue. We didn't like the queuing results associated with a single left, so we looked at a double left and we got the queue to a much more reasonable level. This is another improvement that will be constructed prior to doing the Florida 2. PM peak, unfortunately, and away, as you may already know, we can't run a shorter cycle length there. It's just too difficult. So we have to run the longer cycle there, but again, we have a substantial amount of time at and away. Right now, we give a 12 second split to Woodlawn. Here, the 30 second split. Again, the double left provides significant benefits from a queuing standpoint and the delays in terms of what the average person's waiting at Woodlawn is significantly less at Annaway. One of the things we talked about in March was what's going on with neighborhood traffic. Who's using what signal? We did this old fashioned traffic engineering trick of basically creating a human wall of spotters along the, the, the divider between the county homes and the city homes one morning and we looked and what's going on is that about 45 to 50 percent of all the vehicles that are turning left out of Woodlawn Avenue actually are coming from people that are even farther east of Annaway. So they're cutting through. Why? Because they'd rather wait at one signal than two. Why? Because it's not that difficult of a drive to come through the neighborhood but it comes to cost. Next thing we did in terms of the neighborhood was we looked at comparable travel times. So again, sorry Michelle, I'm picking on you tonight. If you and I left the exact same spot within the neighborhood, I took Anna away, you took Woodlawn, what would happen? So we, we looked at four strategic locations to see what the implications would be of diverting people to Anna away with the Florida T. Stafford and Orchard, pretty much the area that's farthest west in the neighborhood. It was a minute and 45 seconds slower through several travel time runs. The thing to mention here is that in the morning, it might be a minute and 45 seconds slower, but if you're coming back in the evening, your overall round trip, if you're coming in along Cleveland Avenue, you're gonna get the three minutes back. If you're coming in along 273, you can get three minutes back. If you're coming up from Wyoming, you can get seven minutes back. We left Stafford about a minute slower. Same benefits on your return trip. Farther, e farther east, it's about 20 seconds. It's almost a push between leaving closer to Windy Hills. And then sometimes it's just a matter of luck. So 20 seconds versus 40 seconds in terms of our farthest east point. So yes, will it cause you a little bit more delay to go out of and away? Yes, we don't dispute that. You're gonna see a slight benefit when you clear the intersection in the southbound direction. But again, in terms of your round trip, if you're coming home in the PM peak or even in the, the buffer peaks, like you know, 2.30, 3 p.m. up until about 6.30, you're gonna see some significant gains. Another one of the first inquiries was what happens in the neighborhood to traffic. What do we do at Annaway and Hawthorne? What we looked at here was converting the one-way stop to an all-way stop. 
no red flags, the delay is reasonable. So in terms of an intersection that has awkward geometrics, it's on a curve, it's gonna have new traffic patterns, more people are now gonna be coming this way to go down to Anna Way, the suggestion there would be to go to an all-way stop. Another one of the things we dug into was turning paths for emergency personnel within the neighborhood. Here's an ambulance, here's a pumper truck, here's an aerial truck, all successfully maneuvers through the, through the neighborhood. We also reached out to Aetna to get their take. The biggest point here is that in their, you know, in their own words, they said it will be a substantial improvement in terms of response times to both the north and the northeast portions of the city. It's gonna free things up, 273 right out in front of us, the fire hall, that queue will be slightly shorter. It'll be easier to make a right-hand turn and it'll arguably e be easier to clear a left turn onto Cleveland Avenue and come through northbound up towards your neighborhoods. The other points that they hit on was they also supported our suggestion of putting a higher friction surface, a more grittier asphalt surface. This is not tar and chip, this is not rural pavement treatment. The best example close by is Hopkins Road and Pleasant Hill Road. It has a slight orange tinge to it and it really grips the tires. Remarkable safety benefits in wet weather, cold weather, on slopes, on curves. So our suggestion for Anna Way is to put in a high friction surface treatment. So that's where we kind of left off the March presentation. In Mar during the March presentation, we obviously heard feedback from a lot of you in the room. So we looked into those action items that were on our you know, to-do list and we were you know, responsible for providing you answers tonight. The first question, where do we have these things? Where do we have Florida Tees? And I stated this in March, the name Florida T is my bad. In terms of where you can find literature, the first time it came up on a, probably a hot mic during a task force meeting or one of the other public meetings, I said, oh, the Florida T. So to avoid any confusion, I didn't want to start calling it green T or continuous green T or continuous green intersection. Traffic engineers love acronym. So if you look at Florida T or green T or continuous green, it's all the same thing. It's an innovative, traffic engineering and highway engineering at the national level, it's an, it's an innovative treatment that works within the footprint of the existing intersection to make things a little bit more free flow. Some of the feedback is that it frees up congestion and it reduces crashes. I like the statement that the public says agrees it makes sense. Sorry, that's sarcasm. All right, the next question that we've received is, how are we so confident that our tra traffic models allow us to make accurate decisions and predict the future? Where we kind of draw the line in the sand is we have a lot of confidence in our knowledge and our professional judgment, but what we don't like to hear is that people sometimes accuse us of tweaking the model or fudging results. It's not worth it, to be honest, to, you know, to, our public recognition and our public credibility and our ethics is at the level there. It's not worth it to change and tweak these results just to produce something. So if anything, if the takeaway tonight for any of you is that we gave this our best shot and we think the numbers speak for themselves and we double check them and we check them against data that we have readily available. If you pull up your smartphone right now, you can download an app Dot's app, you can pull up this exact same information. It's real-time, continuous traffic counters, and fortunately, one of them is at Cleveland and Woodlawn. So we checked our traffic results and other st studies that we did against this to make sure that we had accurate data and accurate traffic counts in our model. The other thing is we don't always rely on a black box or a software package. Sometimes we use and humans to actually do the work. Michelle and I did travel time runs in our neighborhood. That was my hypothetical example, but we did have manual people do that. Same thing happened along the corridor with UD's research program for graduate and undergraduate engineering students. We checked our travel time results in the software against UD's results. 
Our latest gizmo right now, and we have this along the corridor, is a is it encrypted, encrypted Bluetooth anonymous Bluetooth readers that can they they mark and they identify encrypted Bluetooth IDs from one point to the other. So it tells us what your travel time is. It arguably tells us this is if your Bluetooth is transmitting a signal. It'll tell us you know, where you started from and where you went to, as long as we have scanners out. So what we did most recently is we looked from BJ's down on Route 4, all along the corridor up to Possum Park Road, up to Perkins, and said, OK, what's going on with travel time? What does the Bluetooth data show us? So we looked. During the off-peak periods in the overnight, the top dot, the green dot, is our average. The bottom line is our minimum. It's that person that just got lucky. They were smooth sailing. They were the fastest person on that corridor during that 30-minute segment. So what's interesting when you look at this data is really where the, where the got lucky point really deviates. So we honed in on the evening peak, and what we saw, again, this is from BJ's up to Possum Park Road, is that we're seeing spreads of people that are getting really lucky around 10 minutes to people that are unfortunately waiting about 30 minutes to go that length of time. Again, these are the types of things that we use to double check the traffic models. The elephant in the room, the million dollar question that we received a lot and now we have the data to show you and you know, we have the information on the slide is why can't we just skip that woodlawn signal phase? It's just 12 seconds or it's whatever, you know, Todd measured on his, on his videos. The 12 seconds is green time plus yellow plus red. Yellow and red take away green time from the other three legs of the intersection. So when we look at that 12 seconds and we try and just spread it around without the Florida T, yeah, we can get decent results on the leg that we give eight seconds to, but we can't get down here. We can't even get close to these results with the Florida T. The other question that we received a lot is the concept figure that's been out on the web for a while, is that set in stone? No, it's just a concept. What we do every time we meet with somebody, if I'm meeting with Dean at Panera Bread, then what we're looking at are little constructive comments and input that makes this concept better. One of the suggestions for the Dart bus stop was, hey, you got nine people on average boarding that bus during the day. Why don't you get the bus out of the hot lane, have a pull-off area, so we added a pull-off area. We looked at this spot, it can be accomplished, it's a slight jog in the sidewalk. One of the other things we did was, and one of the suggestions of Councilman Moorhead was to look at the sight lines for that right turn movement. Right now, it's an awkward movement. If you're trying to make a right turn out of Woodlawn, you're looking over your left shoulder out of that weird quarter mirror thing on your driver's side. It's really uncomfortable. You got a kink neck. So we straightened it out. One of the other suggestions is, if the cattle shoot here or the, you know, the channelization, if people think it's too close to their driveway. Right now, it stops about 200 to 300 feet short of 118. We can actually pull that back a little bit farther west. In another slide, I explain kind of the pros and cons associated with the length of that median nose. So the moral of the story here is there are options. It's just a concept. This still has to go through you know, an extensive engineering design and constructive des construction design. But the moral of the story is we more or less work with the, the footprint of the existing intersection. So we know what's out there. Here's a slide on the sight lines, whether or not you can see far enough under the bridge. We measured that manually. The answer there is yes. With this squared off, more comfortable look to your left, you can see far enough under the railroad. Next question, another elephant in the room. What happens to vehicle speeds? So I'll try and avoid talking too technical from a traffic engineering standpoint, but there's a difference between speed and there's a difference between volume or flow. The continuous green, the Florida T, 
that increases the flow, meaning it doesn't bunch people up like a traffic signal and then bounce it down the road. The benefit of these Florida T designs is that if you use concrete and physical channelization, you can create a tunneling effect or a narrowing effect, a traffic calming effect, whatever you want to call it. It's mountable concrete six inches off the ground on your left hand side and you have concrete sidewalk on your right hand side. It's a, conf a more confining feeling. One of the first things they teach you if you want to try and reduce speed is to make, the, make it a little less comfortable for a motorist. That's what this will do. So from a national guidelines and national research standpoint, what we're looking at is a reduction of speed from about two to seven miles an hour through that stretch. So we actually anticipate that speeds will decrease. We check this against a couple different, a couple different um, national guidelines and recommendations and best practices in the industry. So this, the highway manual for traffic capacity said that. Urban city designers said, you know, we'll see somewhere one to three miles an hour. And then, you know, from a crash standpoint, when you reduce speeds, vehicle speeds, arguably crashes are going to go down. Another question is, what's going to happen when a pedestrian comes out and presses the button? How long is it going to halt traffic? So one of the things that we've talked about before publicly, it's not on the slide, is that we would have a warning device that indicates, hey, you have a red signal ahead to give them advanced notification. It's going to be infrequent as to when somebody needs to cross. We have the data right now that shows what's going on, how many times people press buttons, push buttons out there. Right now, our numbers are a little skewed because we have the hotel construction and the sidewalk detour pe people down at the crosswalk. But right now, we anticipate during the peak hour, we're only going to lose somewhere between 1 and 4% of that you know, 3,600 seconds of green. The pedestrian phase itself only needs to run 14 seconds. Another big question. You all brought this to our attention. We had to look into it. What's going to happen to the driveways? What happens to, there's 19 driveways, 21 different houses that front directly and do not have access to any of the side roads along Capitol Trail? This was difficult. This was this was something that we looked at very carefully, and from a modeling standpoint, we, we used the tools and the data that we had in front of us. But um, what I I'm trying to do here is just compare to give kind of an analogy as to what, what's going on. Right now, we all know that there's this halt in traffic. When Capitol Trail, heading out of the city stops, and inbound goes, plus Woodlawn goes, you have a significant time in that signal cycle when you can exit your driveway. Your specific movement leaving your driveway is just an ant, a random act. It's a, it has equal probability of occurring during that big gap. It's whenever you decide to go. But from your, you know, your mental side of things, and the human factor here is that you know that gap is predictable. So it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. We're not going to dispute that. When we look at what happens with the Florida T, those random gaps, or sorry, those more predictable gaps now become random gaps. And what it actually does is it brings us back to the beginning of this whole deck of slides I talked about prior to 2015. Prior to May 2015, we had a different operation going on at that signal. Where we are with gaps and what the models are showing is that we're going to be in a comparable situation respect to your driveways pre-2015. So what did we do? We looked at the crash data prior to 2015 to see if there were any red flags. Will it be a more inconvenient to leave your driveway? Yes. What the, what the numbers are showing and what the analysis shows right now is that it won't be exponentially worse, but it will be more random. The other question that we face with the gap study is, why'd you pick March 22nd? What's so special about March 22nd? Why did you only look at one day? How do you know it wasn't a skewed day? So again, we looked at the data that we had. March 22nd is this red line. Basically, if you draw a flat line across the top, we picked a day that's arguably normal, or it's, it, you know, if you want to say I want a Friday, I can point out a Friday that had less traffic or a Friday that had more traffic. We had to manually 
process this gap data and look at the video manually. So when we got the results for the single day, we compared that against the, the data that we knew and the number of cars that were driving up and down the road, and we said, listen, we do not have an abnormal day. Let's process the data. Another suggestion that came up in March was, what if we get rid of this really tight U-turn in the eastbound direction at Anna Way? What if we made everybody make a jug handle move to come, you know, turn right on Anna Way, swing around the jug handle and come back out? What's that gonna do to Anna Way, especially when you include that with diverted traffic? This is a tough U-turn to make. Just like it's a tough U-turn to make down at Woodlawn, it's a tough U-turn to make down on 273. So in the morning, fortunately it's only seven cars and it really doesn't make much of a difference. In the evening, it's 18 cars. Again, it doesn't make much difference when you put it into what we have in place at Anna Way, which is the ability to give you all more time. We don't have that opportunity at all at Woodlawn. But here, we have, we have ample capacity. So we can give you more green time. If you tell us, listen, I'm trying to leave at 145, and you guys are making me you know, blitz through and I only have seven seconds of green time, why'd you pick that number? You go, well, there's no reason we can't put in 17 seconds of green time. We have a lot of capacity and away. We have none at Woodlawn. We are a soaked sponge at Woodlawn Avenue. Another question that's come up, what happens if there's an emergency? What happens if an away signal is blocked? How do we get into the city? How do we turn left? You guys just choked off Woodlawn Avenue. We can't make a U-turn, can't make the jug handle because there's emergency personnel at Anna Way. Well, the precedent's already been set along the corridor. This is one of the discussion points. If we flip back to those Aetna slides, this was one of those specific discussion points we had with them. At that time, they didn't indicate that they would need these median crossovers, or they said, you know what, it's, you know, it's arguably not a, a, a must have. Now, I think we're at the point with you all that it's something that now, if you drive to Price's Corner, you'll see them. If you drive to Ellesmere, Ellesmere has a ton of them. That's the same road. It's Route 2, State Route 2. So it's something that we would certainly circle back with Aetna on and Newark PD and you all as to where the strategic locations are for emergency crossovers. They're median depressions. The moral of the story here is that there is a serious incident on Capitol Trail and Newark PD, Aetna, the fire police, they're on hand and they're going to direct traffic if the road is shut down for a substantial amount of time. Another, what's going on next door? All this dirt that's moving around. Why don't you guys wait? You know, the, the hotel's gonna generate a lot of traffic. We heard a lot of questions about the hotel and the restaurant. So up until today, we've been telling people, listen, they did a traffic study to assess the impacts when they had to look at it. And then also, generally speaking, in terms of what's out there in you know, national guidelines and national recommendations is that a hotel doesn't have the same peak hour as a major roadway. They're, they're staggered. So we ran it. We said, all right, let's plug in a 125-room hotel and a 125-seat restaurant. What happens? The moral of the story is it adds 15 cars during the evening rush hour. 11 cars will go through, through the Florida T. Four of them will turn left on the Cleveland Avenue. That's less than 1% of the approaching traffic. We see blips and we see fluctuations along the corridor much more significant than 1%. We're not hanging our hat on this number, but it's definitely not something that says we should take a time out, we should reassess once the hotel's open. The reality is that the hotel will be open, the restaurant will be open, and the project, the Florida Tees project will still be on its schedule for 2020, 2021. That's my last slide. I just stole my own thunder. Did you say 15 vehicles an hour? It's 15 vehicles that, would, that are expected during the peak hour of the roadway. Yes, yeah, so this slide, this is straight out of the book. So this slide says how many cars, how many more trips are going to occur and use the roadway on the during the same time frame as, as the peak hour of that road. So we know the Capitol Trail has a peak hour between you know, 445 and 545 some days, 430, 530, 5 to 6. It has a peak hour between 4 and 6 p.m., more of the story. From that, we take the number of, ro number of rooms, 51% are entering, 49% are exiting. So we basically did a traffic impact study real quick, 
just to prove to ourselves and to provide you all with an answer that, hey, it's, you know, is it a lot of traffic? And it's not. At least that's what, not what the analysis and the numbers are showing. The other question that popped up recently is, how many trips is, how many trips are being generated from the neighborhood? And how many do we think are using Woodlawn Avenue throughout the entire day? So, City of Newark provided the GIS. We have 658 homes. 250 of those, 252 are within the city. 406 are within the county. Those 658 homes are expected to generate 6,200 trips in a day. It's a lot of trips. Half of them coming in, half of them coming out. When we look at what's going on traffic-wise along Capitol Trail, the, the end result is that right now, leaving Woodlawn Avenue throughout the entire day, we anticipate, or you know, the numbers which suggest that this, a neighborhood of this size that plopped down today would generate about 1,700 trips throughout the day on Woodlawn Avenue, just leaving, turning left, going through. Again, that's the same, same analysis that we did for the hotel. So then we compared that. We said, okay, we have 1,700 trips on Woodlawn Avenue. How's that compared to the other three lights of the intersection? We have 16,000 on Capitol Trail coming in, 15,000 on Cleveland Avenue coming in, and about 20,000 coming in from the McDonald's. We then looked at what's going on delay-wise during just the AM rush hour and the PM rush hour to see you know, from a quality standpoint what's going on with Num percent of daily traffic, Woodlawn generates about 3% of the daily traffic, sees about 2%, 2.6% of the rush hour delay. But it, because it requires 12 seconds, green plus yellow plus red, it takes up 8 to 10% of the signal cycle. One of the other questions was, okay, you got looked at the driveways. You said, all right, it's not an exponentially worse change for traffic gaps coming through the driveways. And away traffic signal, you don't have any red flags there from the Florida T. What happens at Possum Park Road? What happens at the Perkins right here? Is the Florida T going to pump all this more traffic to Possum Park? So we ran that. We included Possum Park in this massive traffic model now. And yellow is existing, orange is proposed with the Florida T. This is like two car lengths, two, three car lengths difference in terms of the queue. So we have delays that are much more reasonable. Remember the 200 second delays we were seeing down at Cleveland Avenue? These are like 45 second delays. So we don't see anything in the morning or in the evening that says we're gonna pump too much traffic farther east. The influence area of the Florida T in terms of major traffic gaps and major traffic you know, throughput doesn't extend this far east. The last question, when's it gonna happen and how much is it gonna cost? So right now, the Florida T would be constructed, hypothetically speaking, under the same project that's going to repave Cleveland Avenue. That project right now is second in line in terms of city of Newark wreaking havoc with traffic during construction. A lot of roads in Newark need to be repaved. The guy that's selling you shocks and wheels and tires knows that because everybody's, you know, the roads here, they need, they need help. So Main Street is first. Main Street's gonna be repaved starting in hopefully 18 or 19. And then behind that, because we can't have too many roads shut down or under, under lane closures and flaggers at the same time, Cleveland Avenue will begin. So we're looking at late 2020, early 2021 is when Cleveland Avenue, the repaving that starts here and goes all the way to New London Road would occur. And this project would be done as part of that. The big thing here is that the majority of this work can be constructed within the existing footprint of the intersection. So as a whole, if, if we screw up, and we take a big slice of humble pie here. We didn't widen the road an extra 20 feet. We didn't tear out a bridge. We didn't do all this other stuff. 
we more or less put in stuff that is, you know, it, it can be reversed. This is a concrete island. If we screw up and this isn't the right treatment for this intersection, then we yank it out. If the numbers after you know, an analysis period and an evaluation period, it would, it would come out and we'd say, you know what, we, we were wrong. It's less safe, it doesn't move as much traffic, and that's, that's the, the point of these treatments. If we go all the way back to the national level and the national guidelines, it suggests these types of treatments that you have to look at very carefully, and you all, you, you did, you helped us look at it very carefully. This is a prototype that has gone through a lot of different iterations and a lot of constructive input along the way. So you have to look at it carefully, and then for the most part, it's something that you didn't, you don't waste millions and millions of dollars. The case study that I referred to earlier, it suggested that all of these were done for you know, about $300,000. This is gonna be packaged up as part of a, a multi-million dollar repaving along Cleveland Avenue that includes a lot of ADA and sidewalk upgrades. So we're gonna have good unit costs. We're not sending somebody out that's gonna, you know, have really high costs to just do this isolated location. It will be mobilized together, so the cost is gonna be somewhere in the 300 to 500 range. We welcome your questions at this time. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, for those of you standing in the back, I've saved front row seats for you. If you would like to come forward, you're welcome to do so. All right, we're going to open up a discussion from the table. We'll start with Councilman Moorhead, please. Thanks. Um, I'd like to check a couple facts, Matt. Um, the, did you, uh, your slide now, um, 5.8 years of data, crash data. Is slide nine, January 2012 to October 2017. Okay, and did you say 20,000 cars per day are coming through that corridor right there? In that direction of that data? Yes. Okay. Just in that direction. So the, the annual daily traffic, the average annual daily traffic for the entire segment, both directions, is arguably that number times two. So it's 40,000 total for the roadway, roughly 20,000 pumping in from the south. Yeah, but 20,000 per day relative to slide now, specifically. Being the accidents for that one direction. Is that a correct understanding? No, the, these crashes are in both directions. Both directions. So, okay, 40, so these, numbers are, these numbers are even half. Of the, the crashes would be half you're assuming half or northbound? A little more than half? Something. We, we did not, know. yeah, we did we not do know. a directional. If you okay. need a directional analysis, we could look at that. They could be all coming northbound for, for what we know. Correct. Okay. So those of you that don't know me, I'm, uh, I'm a technical guy. Um, I like data, I like the numbers. Um, and what I see here is something that um, it, it pleased the engineers. Um, my concerns are um, around safety. Um, and I think we haven't fully understood the changes we've made to the intersection and the changes that we're proposing to make to Cleveland Ave as well. My point there is, the double left coming north on um, library, turning onto Cleveland, has to immediately merge because council voted to make Cleveland a narrower road. Um, so there's a piece of that that's gonna back up the traffic that this is supposed to fix. Anyways, it, we don't know. Um, the sight lines, my, the concern that, that Matt said, um, the sight line under the bridge, it's true, the sight line's long enough if the cars are going the speed limit. If the cars are exceeding the speed limit, the sight line's too short. Now we all know everybody speeds through there. Um, I believe the last 
Well, I'll let you see the data. <laughs> um, I'll, be, I'll be brief here, because this is going to be a long night. I think technically this looks like something that, that uh, you know, makes some sense in some situations. I'm not at all convinced it makes sense in this situation. And for the safety concerns, the, the U-turn at the, for another example, the U-turn at the hotel means that the pedestrians have to walk longer across the street, which means you have to put more time there. I'm not sure we've understood all of those things. Um, so at this point, um, I am going to hand the microphone to someone else. All right. Uh, thank you. And you may be. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to kind of start out with a, a statement that was made about the left turn off of Woodlawn and the crash data being greater at the corner by Porter used car lot. And I do see that their crash data is higher since the change has been made. And I guess my question to this is, I think it's disingenuous to say that the crash data is higher because of all the people leaving Woodlawn Avenue when it seems to me it's bad behavior on the other side of the highway. These people aren't coming out making a left against the light. They're making the left when the light tells them to make a left. So it seems to me that the fix to that problem is on the other side of the highway, is not on the woodlawn side of the highway. Uh, another question I have is the eight to 10% uh, signal cycle. Would that signal trigger if there are no cars there coming out of Woodlawn? I explained this to Todd before the meeting started. There is a, there is a loop detector. There are two inductive detectors on the approach that only detect when a vehicle is present. However, if a vehicle in the preceding cycle, if you're ahead of me and you clear on yellow or red, if it, you know, as lawfully you're allowed to clear on yellow, you're allowed to go over that loop, the signal computer puts it in a fail-safe mode. It thinks, it, it assumes that you may be trapped out beyond the detection zone. So what it does next cycle is it gives you a green. It's, we call them ghost calls or phantom calls. It's a fail-safe method that if somebody in the pre prior cycle went through, there's a chance that they may be trapped, so it flushes you out just in case, so that you're not hung out to dry. The reality is you're probably gonna back up, but that's just the mode that's in place now. So is it vehicle actuated? Yes. Are there implications with Actuation and traffic signals, absolutely. And that's, that's one of the operations that can be perceived as not being an actuated signal. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm glad you, I'm glad you uh, brought that up uh, because I, I was thinking about this as I transverse the town. I go over to the east side of town a lot, whether it's City Hall or Eater or whatever. So I generally take Woodlawn Avenue over. And I can tell you between 4.30, 5.30, quarter to six, Wood, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Wyoming Road, you can't get through that signal. I'm gonna tell you why you can't get through that signal is because the people that are coming eastbound off of Wyoming will try to squeeze in the light and it shuts down that intersection. So I'm bringing this up only because I see other intersections, in particular the one down at Route 40 and 72, where the straight goes first. And if the straight were to go first and the turn would go second, then you probably wouldn't have people blocking that intersection the way you do now. And I think that is a huge issue with the backup from Wyoming Route out, is people blocking that intersection. So I bring this up because it doesn't seem to me that we talk about how Del Dot has taken a holistic look at everything, but yet you didn't, that seemed to be a simple one to identify. Uh, so 
I, I, have, I have to question that intersection as part of the, the bigger picture. So, so that's definitely something that we could look at. It's, it's called a lag left turn phase. The, the implication with that type of treatment is that the current left turn operation that's out there, where you're allowed to still choose to turn left if it's a green ball, meaning you have to yield to opposing through traffic, that would have to change. So you, you can't have a lagging left turn, meaning the through goes first. There's, a, you know, there's another safety implication associated with that. It's something that we could look at, and it's certainly something that we could um, analyze as to switching to lag phasing, but it's not, it's not overly obvious unless we get input such as you provide tonight to look into that. Well, you know, it's, it, uh, the dynamics are certainly different down on Route 40 because you probably don't have the issue of that type of backup. You're correct. Uh, uh, so I know the dynamics are different, but it just seemed to me when I was looking at that that uh, I don't know that there was a consideration uh, for that. The uh, other concern and the other thing that we analyze there is what's the potential for the queue, the, the left turn to block access to the through movement or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So um, the closest example that we have is Route 2 at Red Mill Road by the 7-Eleven right. and by the cemetery there, right. where at times, because we have that lag treatment, you can prevent people, if the through lane queues up too quickly, you're just blocked and you can't get to the green arrow. So those are the things that we would look at in this instance with Wyoming. Right, I understand. Um, the, we were talking about the response time, and one of the uh, issues that the traffic data uh, suggests is to, uh, you know, on the double left under the bridge onto Cleveland Avenue. And I'm going to tie this in, in two directions, if I may. Um, you have the double left, and yet we're talking about tail end accidents. Sooner or later, that traffic stops, and sooner or later, you take that risk that there's still going to be uh, tail end accidents there. That, that dynamic, I don't see necessarily changing, albeit, as you've suggested, that the time for that left turn, in fact, is longer. Uh, uh, the question I, I really have for that is, that you're going to have a hawk signal potentially. If this were to pass tonight, you're going to have a hawk signal by uh, Alders Creek, I guess it's called, and Porter Chevrolet. Uh, so you're going to have a hawk signal there, and you're going to have the uh, crosswalk also on Kirkwood Highway. Both of them shut the intersection down potentially because what would happen knowing, you know, I guess I don't know whether you still use the Monarch traffic system or whatever we talked about it the other day, but that's supposed to time and react to other signals. What would happen at the height of rush hour because you're going to have younger people going to work from Alders Creek that work in Newark, you're gonna certainly have uh, young people going to Newark High School uh, because that's not far enough to be bused. Once that crosswalk is activated, the hawk signal at McKee's Lane, how does that affect the intersection? Because it seems to me that if there's not a tie-in, that if it isn't tied in, then you're still going to have a lot of people going around, uh, going around the curb there, potentially blocking the intersection. And if it is tied in, you still shut the intersection down. I know it doesn't shut the the constant green down, but it certainly shuts the, the left, which is probably a bolt of the traffic. How, how does that work? So, try and pull up the slide. It's one of the earlier slides with the left. It's probably the best graphic that I have. Um, the hawk signal would be coordinated, and there's pros and cons with coordinating the hawk. We use, the, the software we use now is a little different than Monarch, but the Hawk would be arguably here at McKee's. Mm -hmm. And the, the time in the cycle that that crosswalk would be on or that the Hawk would go through its Hawk thing, various displays, would be when this left turn movement is going. 
So you would cross from the east side of Cleveland Avenue over to the median refuge in the middle. So you would not have that conflict to turn left. Just like this is a relatively short crosswalk, if you put a refuge island in the middle, then you would have a short, shorter crossing there so that you're not in this phase, because I see your point with that phase. Mm -hmm. the, the implications of a hawk, though, I know this is kind of a secondary agenda item, the implication with a hawk is that it's not instant gratification. It's, it's still going to rely for a pedestrian who could be impatient to press the button and wait for the display because we have to run it coordinated. We can't have this conflict here. So with a hawk, that's the implication. If we took a step back and did a, a, a warning treatment, a, a, a rapid flashing beacon like we have at Judge Morris, that is instant gratification. As soon as somebody presses it, it'll pop, it'll, the warning lights will turn on. So there's, it's a double-edged sword as to what treatment we would look at, um, but from an evaluation standpoint, what we modeled and what we've looked at from a hawk standpoint is definitely coordinating this movement with this left turn phase when you're not allowed to turn left off the Capitol Trail for those reasons that you mentioned as well. Okay. Uh, the uh, response time to, you mentioned uh, response time to the northeast. Uh, let's take response times to uh, Cleveland Avenue for emergency services. Uh, how how were, were, was that information gathered that the response time would be exponentially uh, uh, greater? I mean, not slower, but you know, would be quicker. Uh, that was that was actually me. So I, I met with G Island, yeah, no, and we discussed the, um, all the all the items in the task force recommendations. And when we got to the one, uh, it affected them twofold. The first, um, now it was a while ago, but the first one was that they had issues with the response time getting uh, firefighters to the station. Um, so in being able to free up traffic further south on. Uh, Library Avenue will help get uh, firemen to the station more quickly. And then when they leave, when they get to the intersection here, especially during busy times, apparently it's congested to the level that they are concerned about throwing on their sirens because people start swerving and then they call back. So they, uh, it was related to me that they generally move the traffic, get through the intersection, and then turn on their, their sirens and, and, and go from there. So. Uh, if that's the case, all the, the time savings that you've seen on the slides, they would apply directly to the response times to ambulances and fire trucks and things moving through, because uh, they're sitting through it right now. Okay, I, thank you, Tom. Um, I do have uh, a lot of other concerns, but in the interest of time and giving my fellow council members time to ask their questions as well, I'll probably hold the rest of them to the end, but one thing, I would like to ask you, I mean, you and I talked about the Bluetooth tracking ability to track cell phones. And what about how many, what is the capability if, if the four of us were in my car and had cell phones, would that then register with you as four vehicles? Does it, is it, shall we say, smart enough to know that we are in one car or? So the Bluetooth device, Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong. The Bluetooth device has to be in a transmission or locate type of mode. And it's my understanding that the kind of the automatic Bluetooth hookup between your car and your phone is kind of always in search mode. And that's the signal that's picked up. Just just the fact that you and I have cell phones in our pockets and they have Bluetooth capability doesn't mean we're going to be picking you up. The other analogy that our vendor provided us with is if you're for some reason driving around with a Bluetooth mouse on and that blue light is flashing, like it's trying to link or sync up, that is transmitting a signal that could be predicted. But back to the root of your question, mm -hmm. yes, it will register if there's a bus full of people that have Bluetooth headphones that are wireless trying to listen to their phone, 
that connection is apparently another signal that we can receive, we would pick that up as the exact same dot. And we've done that before, and when we get the Bluetooth data, we don't just take it at the summary level, we look at the raw level. So it's something that we would see the exact same transmission from the exact same spot at the, nearly the same instant that it passes. We had to do this substantially for the I-95 project that you know, we're looking at up by Frawley Stadium. And there we did have significant number of you know, tour buses that came through and all of a sudden we'd have 50 blips. So we have to kind of manually go through that and parse it through with, you know, it's, it's just an Excel spreadsheet that we look at and we run, you know, we run an analysis to look at that and make sure that we don't have outliers. The same thing could be said is if you go to Pep Boys to stop and get your tire changed, we're gonna pick you up at one point at maybe like three o'clock and then maybe you didn't clear the intersection until 5.30 or something at Perkins to go get out know, dinner. That's an outlier that we would pick up and screen. So mm -hmm. we like to look at the raw data to look for those red flags. Okay, and just one pet I'll comment. You were talking about traffic calming, and I get that because I remember years ago we talked about more brick uh, crosswalks and all that as being traffic calming mechanisms. And I look at I look at the ultimate traffic calming that I've seen in this neighborhood or in this area. I'm sorry, uh, Harmony, as it goes through uh, uh, my Pilgrim Gardens and so forth from. Uh, report to 273. Have you ever seen that it did slow people down temporarily? Yeah, I mean, it's a different situation there and it's a different context. And, and I understand that you all are analyzing things kind of in your, you know, city of Newark neighborhoods from these mini circles and other traffic calming devices. Um, the, the philosophy behind why the literature suggests that in this instance people are gonna drive slower through there is that right now, when you're coming through, first of all, you're bunched up as a traffic signal. So you kind of have that frustration aspect of trying to beat the light or to clear, and you know, you just waited through several cycles, so you're, you're, you're aggravated. But um, right now when they depart, you have 23, 24 feet in certain spots of just black pavement that you feel comfortable. If a, if a car is not next to you, then you don't have that physical object to kind of make you feel confined. And the, the Florida T, the treatment, kind of the cattle shoot, as we were calling it, will have the confining effect. And it's very consistent with just narrowing lanes, using lane widths that are less comfortable for people. And this is, this kind of bucks the trend from the 80s and 90s where everybody was so focused on providing cars the smoothest roadway and moving people in cars from A to B. Narrowing lanes is, it's coming now to the forefront from a safety standpoint and from a you know, calming mechanism to, to make people feel a little bit less comfortable. I mean, are you gonna have people that will off track and maybe run up on the curb and rub their tire every once in a while? Scratch a, you know, a wheel, yes. But you know, overall the benefit is that people will feel less comfortable they will drive slower, they will be much closer to the, you know, to the speed limit, the posted speed limit. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Moving on to Councilwoman Wallace, please. Thank you. Uh, I will withhold most of my questions until after the public has had a, had a chance to, uh, to, to speak. I do have one question, though. Um, during the Cleveland Avenue Task Force, I know there was some discussion or there was a comment on the part of Delvat about um, close, there's, there are plans to close one of the intersections. Is that a correct statement? Is that in a way or would one? Is that, I heard that from a member of the uh, task force. So is that correct or not? I think maybe the analogy that I used at the time or the example was at face value right now, the amount of traffic that uses the Anaway signal would not even meet traffic warrants for that signal. That might be what you're okay. referring to is that, in other words, 
we have a signal in place because at the time the thought was that the neighborhood would, would use it when it was installed. The traffic levels that are there, it's so underutilized that theoretically you could shut it down. It, the numbers suggest that it, it doesn't, there's not enough volume there to do it. Would we do that? Absolutely not. Or, I mean, it, it was, I think, I believe at the time it was an analogy of like, all right, you know, here's where we are. So if you were to plop the neighborhood in now as a new development, just like a new hotel, that would be the spot to provide signalization, not at Woodlawn. Okay, thank you for, for clarifying. Thank you, Councilwoman. Moving on to Councilman Hamilton, please. Thank you. Um, the Alders Creek crosswalk, why does that have to be coupled with the Florida T? The one across from Porter Chevrolet, correct? Correct. Um, do you want to bring up the simulation? The, the, the moral of the story is that this, these gains here equate to a queue length that goes back to all the way back to McKees. And the issue with putting in a median island for pedestrians to cross at Alders Creek halfway. So you cross westbound Cleveland first, and then you go to a median refuge island, and then cross eastbound Cleveland Avenue. That median would be severely obstructed and be a problem if we don't do the Florida T. Like the, the queues in this lane extend far beyond Alders Creek. With the Florida T, and when we bring the numbers in to this level, the queue is, for the majority of the time, the 50th percentile, and even now maybe even the 95th percentile queue is within that limit, so it's something that could be provided. But we have crosswalks on Main Street, which backs up as well. I'm not convinced that can't do one without the other. So I, I would highly emphasize that this is not, we still take care of those pedestrians on Cleveland Avenue as best we can. Um, one, the, one, uh, if I could jump in real quick. So uh, one of the recommendations that was already approved by council is a crosswalk. It's just not immediately at the McKees Lane uh, intersection. It, it will be somewhere to the west, probably uh, 200 yards west, with a rectangular rapid flash beacon, the instant gratification version with a pedestrian refuge island. So there will be a crosswalk there. Um, it just won't be at the intersection. It will be further to the west. Uh, it will require some, probably some, sidewalk to be run into Alders Creek to provide direct access to the crosswalk. Thank you. I, I knew I wasn't insane. I, so, I remember us talking about that. So, sorry to interrupt. So, the implication of that is if we put the median refuge islands in as well, that we'd likely only have one lane passing that refuge island at that certain point, so that you know, if it's a left turn queue that stacks up and kind of chokes things off the right turn movement that comes down, you know, 600 cars in the peak hour, it would get choked off because that refuge island is there. But then you know, the implication or the alternative would be to not put in a refuge island and have that person try and cross both lanes, you know, both directions of Cleveland Avenue, all at one shot. Thank you. Um, Sir, we're going to do public comment in a moment. There's no discussion from the audience at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mark alluded to this, uh, Mr. Moorhead. With all the changes that council has approved on Cleveland Avenue, and I'm all for making changes and trying um, changes, and I'm glad that this is going to be, if it does pass, potentially reversible. Leads to two questions. Who decides whether it's working or not, the residents or you guys? Um, but why not just let the other improvements play out first? There is, I agree entirely. If we're making two lanes go down to one lane on Cleveland Avenue, <laughs> you're going to get a backlash. Did I just win the word? But um, there's going to be a backup. So all of these things are. You guys have thrown them into the computer models, and uh, we all know that that doesn't help work out. Uh, this may seem unrelated, but 
was any of this, there's an intersection that I absolutely abhor, and it's Kerfoot Highway, Limestone Road, inter Road intersection. If anybody was involved in that, that has been working on this, don't trust your information at all. But that's, <laughs> that is the worst, trying to pull out of Clare Estates, make a right there at any time. That's what I envision these people having to deal with along Kerfoot Highway, at, getting out of their neighborhood. They can't, and then you make a right, and then you try to make a left onto Kerfoot Highway from Limestone Road when you're going north on Limestone Road. You can't even get to that left-hand turn signal. Like, it is one of the worst intersections on the planet, and and I, somebody designed that. Somebody thought it was a good idea. And I understand you guys have done a heck of a lot of work on this, and I'm glad you're making it somewhat reversible. Um, but why aren't we waiting and seeing the other information first before we do that? So, so as, as, as Tom and, and I explained at the beginning, we, we set up a process with the committees and this is what came out of the committees. The, we weren't, I had, when we went into this originally, when it showed up on our radar and we started talking to the city and Will Mapco about setting up a committee to try to address all these issues, I had, we had no preconceived notions of a Florida T being a recommendation coming out of all this. This is something that the original Cleveland Avenue Committee asked us to address, and so we addressed it. Um, so the information that we're showing is the best of our ability, the analysis and of what the implications of that would be, and we've tried to answer the dozens and dozens of questions that came along with that. Um, and we see some positive behind this, but I don't, we're not pushing it either. So not doing it also has implications. As again, there's a certain amount of delay out there today. There's congestion, there's safety issues. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, for, for the council to decide. So we, as we've talked about in the previous meetings and back to the committee meetings, um, and, and you know, Tom alluded to it earlier as well. We had kind of the menu of items. Uh, the council's approved the rest of the menu except for the, this is the main one left and then, you know, the hawk being the, the tail end if, if that comes about. So if this is voted down, that is exactly what will happen. Um, you know, we will we'll pack it up and, and uh, uh, again, it, it could conceivably come back in the future or it just never comes back. Um, the other part you were asking about was reversing it. So. Ultimately, officially, anything we do to the roads, in the state roads in the city, there needs to be agreement between the city and the state. So when, when we are doing a state project, um, the way state code is written is that um, we need to enter an agreement with the, with the city on, on every state project we do, and, and we basically were jointly agreeing on what we're doing. So that'll happen for this project when we get to final plans, um, relate, just the paving job, even the paving. Um, we'll have a, you know, basically the, this, we prepare it, you all, I'm Tom, I don't know if you sign it or if the mayor signs it, I'm not sure, but somebody signs off on the, it's called a town agreement, it's a city agreement, whatever, and so we, we jointly agree. Um, so the removal would be similar. We would have to jointly agree. Thank you very much. Moving on to Councilman Chapman, please. At this point, I don't have any outstanding questions, so uh, that may change after public comment. Thank you. Markham? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just want to reiterate, the council has already approved every recommendation from the, the task force, which was a committee of residents and business owners within the city. Um, and Cleveland Avenue is in my district. So, so far, they've had uh, parking removed, and uh, Market uh, Avenue will lose its inbound or outbound traffic. So, uh, I want to do a little comparison with Market for just a minute. Are there any you know, like churches, schools, or businesses back in this area that would drive traffic for more in the future? I couldn't find any. I want somebody to confirm that. So. I'm sorry, I we couldn't hear you. It Churches, schools, businesses, or any potentials for uh, back in this area? That are in the neighborhood? Yes, in that, in that area that serves Woodlawn. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. 
Um, you asked, there was a question about warrants, and I know anyway there doesn't qualify. How many traffic lights does this area qualify? And you know I, I asked because uh, the bank traffic and um, Possum Park and you know uh, residents not being able to get their traffic lights. So how many warrants or how many lights does this qualify? Is it one? Is it two? There's, there's no straight technical answer to that. For a development of this size, normally it would be one. One, okay. It's uh, really, you have to look at everyone on a case-by-case -case basis, what the, what the traffic volume is on the, on the adjoining street, what the street network is, what other access points there are. So there's, you know, there's, there's not a straight answer, but I'm kind of going out on a, on a limb here and saying that something of this size, you'd normally have one traffic. The, the kind of the gist of the traffic generation projections that we did for the neighborhood is that if you put that into the context of a traffic impact study, that you would not allow a fourth signal phase here at this intersection if the neighborhood just came in because of the level of service implications. Okay. Whereas at Anna Way, that is where the appropriate place to serve a neighborhood of that size would be. Right. Anna I mean, I've seen a lot of changes in this, so, and I think this is most I've ever seen a project evolve. The sidewalk with the bus pull off, with two lanes on air way, the, the adjustment of timing. So, a lot going on here. Um, so, I think you stated, and I just want to confirm that traffic and rush hour would clear faster in the intersection in Cleveland Avenue back past paper mill? Does it go back to New London too? Yeah, I mean, back, I guess back to Councilman Hamilton's question about why package it up is that you know, th this is why. So we're already in kind of a road diet or you know, it, when we talk about bringing Cleveland Avenue down to a single lane, the, the benefit of the Florida T is that the eastbound movement along Cleveland Avenue from New London all the way to here is is all associated with kind of these results. So in the morning, it's it's a very substantial gain in the eastbound direction, and that, that's people that can't clear. And then in the evening, it's it's even worse. Let's to clear. Sorry. Let's go ahead and wait, please. I think we're going to see comparable improvements in along Cleveland Avenue from a travel time standpoint as well. Um, and when, you, when you package that with eliminating Margaret Street and the fifth leg at Paper Mill at that signal, plus kind of the getting rid of the snowball effect that occurs. I mean, a delay of this size will extend from you know 4 p.m. to 6, 6.30 p.m. It's, it's that significant of a delay that it just kind of it clamps the end of the hose, just like in the northbound direction. So I, I sorry to, to beat a dead course here, Council on Hamilton, but it is, it makes sense as part of the whole package. So early on, there was uh, peak numbers that was were generated during rush hour traffic. And if I read these right, um, in the morning, it looks like there's about 75 coming out of Woodlawn versus 3,500 on the other legs, with 29 turned into Woodlawn. You, I don't think you have that particular slide up on the website. Oh yeah, I believe the the schematic of yeah. the volumes is on there. Yeah, you're correct. And then the um, PM, there's actually 60 versus 3,800 um, turning into Woodlawn, and actually some. Are coming out of Woodland, actually 74 go Woodland, so there's a 
actually net positive going into Woodlawn, turning right into Woodlawn? In, in the evening, yes. yeah, you're going to see a higher inbound movement coming in. Um, but yeah, the, the numbers that you're speaking to, the schematic that's on the task force website, I mean, it's generally consistent with what we're seeing here in terms of the, the big picture, how much traffic is on the other three le legs relative to Woodlawn. Um, that's, that's at the peak hour level. This is kind of at the daily level. Um, but I, I don't have that schematic in front okay. of me. I apologize. All right, because I'm just comparing it to Margaret, and Margaret has 89 uh, exiting in the PM, so it's actually um, those people be routed to paper mill. So I'm trying to. Mm, um, that's really I'm just trying to make a comparison that Margaret actually is a heavier um, views than the afternoon than Woodlawn is. Yeah, I think that has to do with the fact that Margaret Street gets a pull from um, the the office complexes that are next to Timothy's. So yeah, there's about 700 pieces or so. Correct, and that's. That drives more than, so in the evening, a facility like that from a trip generation standpoint is going to get an exit type of pool, whereas a residential community is going to get more of an inbound pool um, to return home during the evening. But you're right, I mean, they're comparable numbers, but you know, yeah. it's. So, I guess what I'd always for a time of day solution. And I know copy doesn't move. I don't understand why we can't um, gate this and then during the rush hours and let them go during the uptime. That would solve all of the ex questions. I mean, I know it's something delicate, but de uh, probably isn't it, but the railroads do it all the time. And you right. have something similar, but probably my biggest issue is that the disparity on the wait times for people that are coming to the residents go through that. So, hammer. If we are issue, is there a way to do it? I, I mean, theoretically, you could you could omit the phase, and that, that's kind of what this slide hits on: is that during the evening rush hour, if we did a electronic version of a gate, meaning we did not provide those twelve seconds, what would happen? without the geometrics of the Florida T, so you would leave the footprint exactly the same, what that looks like are, are these numbers here. And that, that question is extremely valid. So it's, you're looking at, you know, here's the existing values. If we take eight seconds of the 12 and give it to northbound, what happens? Okay, northbound goes from 199 to 102. Southbound still, it really, you know, we don't see any improvement along Cleveland Avenue. We don't see any improvement to Cleveland Avenue until we get to giving them time. So I, it's, I, it's, I understand it's, that. It's the chasing our tail. I understand that. I just, I cannot get my mind wrapped around why we can't do a full speed with a gated system. Where you allow the green light through the rush hour. And I know you're frowning, but uh, you know, it stops a lot of other issues that people don't have to deal with it, so. I, I was pondering, sorry. <laughs> sorry for the facial expression. Um, I mean, the, 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 the main aspect and the main feature of the Florida T is the channelization. Um, so it's, it's then a matter of how do you get this left turn traffic to come in without side swiping if we don't have any sort of physical divider. So that, that's the difficulty about not doing the Florida T or trying to do a Florida T time of day based that you know you can open up the neighborhood at other times. Um, it's it's. I, I guess I still don't understand. You couldn't have concrete there for separating the lane. So at three three and a half years, so. Uh, Haven't been. Interesting. I'm just. I, I've never heard it to you before, but I'm just contemplating how you. Time day solutions for. Me. I'll sketch it out. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Engineer. Um, I'll just. Any other questions I have while you for that? We definitely have to think extremely outside the box as to how you would 
make that function and at times the crux of the matter is if, if this is under signal control, the numbers indicate that we need two left turn lanes and two through lanes. So that's why presently the middle lane is a shared through left. It's just so that I don't know how sometimes we would still allow this middle lane to come through if the concrete is present is what I'm struggling with on the fly. I mean, you would have to remove the circular or the arc there because the people would still have to come out of Woodlawn at some point in time. But you could still put concrete down further so it's very people fight for each other. It's going to be penalized anyway, so. All right, I'm, I'm not going to force you to answer now. So. Uh, so uh, do you have the level of risk numbers before what it currently is versus what it could be? And I guess it's all uh, four segments there. I think I got your question. So level of service right. presently versus proposed. Yes. So and I'd like it on each leg. So you, you can get that back to me later. We have delays per leg, but we don't have level of service per leg. Um, so we could we could walk through them. So you know, I saw that in some other documents. So. Yeah, it was in a prior slide, and um, I, we've kind of made the executive decision that some people don't understand the grade aspect. Um, so the left turn here, that's a completely failing grade. Um, what was that D? No, no, F. F, F is in Frank. Okay. 114 is F is in Frank. Um, and I was thinking it was going to go to a C. Is that correct? So it would go up to... It goes to a C. You're correct. Okay. C is in cat. Uh, that is also an F is in Frank. And it's a C is in cat. Uh, that is an F is in Frank. A is an apple. F is in Frank. A is an apple. Uh, I don't know. I, I I did not memorize D to a C. D is in David. That leaves Woodlawn. So. Sorry. Woodlawn. Woodlawn. Yeah. Is that A service or at the Woodlawn's level of service at it is an F. F is in Frank. Oh, it's an F too. Yeah, and it has a its delay is based on the overall cycle length. So okay. it okay. has like a ninety-eight second delay, but it's a hundred and fifty second cycle length. So it means that they clear, but they just don't have much time. So it's F is in Frank at Anna. I believe it's C is in Cat. Okay, thank you. Even after we divert, do you want me to continue through? Okay. Good. Head and open. So we have a uh, stand here. We'll soon have a microphone. When your name is called, please come forward to the stand with a microphone on it. Please, your name and your address and or your district. And if you are not living in the city of Newark, please say that you're a non-resident. Remember that we are recording this, so it's important that you speak into the microphone. And I will begin with Elizabeth Eldridge. Hi, good evening. My concerns are, I travel Cleveland Avenue during rush hour traffic, and right now, I can turn left onto Capitol Trail and get in the right-hand lane so that I can safely turn into my development. With this, I now have to turn into the left lane and then figure out how to move to the right lane with traffic barreling past me because people in that lane, they might slow down while that barrier's there. As soon as the end of that barrier, they're moving into the right lane and they're all over the place. So my safety is at risk trying to get into the development after taking that turn. The second one, bad weather. At all costs, I do not go down wind or and away it is snowing because that road is treacherous 
It is icy. And they say, oh, well, we'll sand it and everything. No, over, you know, during the day it melts, overnight it freezes. It is treacherous. I always go out woodlawn, whether I'm turning left or right. And I have to come all the way through Windy Hills and, and around to get there. But for my safety, that's what I do. I do not go down that hill. I've been living there over 40 years. I know, don't go down that hill when it's icy. So it's a safety concern for me. Also, if I have to go up and make a U-turn at Main Street, I can make the U-turn, it's okay. But now I have to watch all that traffic coming around the turn there, okay? I have to watch all that. I now have to watch people going into the hotel, people coming out of the hotel. And it is not safe to make a U-turn there now the way it is, because I have to do it a couple times. It's not safe to do it. And my question would be, if we're all talking about rush hour from four to six o'clock in the afternoon, why not just make that a red light at Woodlawn from four in the afternoon to six, you can't turn left, and the rest of the time, let us turn left. Thank you, Elizabeth. Paul, please. Please frame from applause. It's gonna make the meeting last that much longer. I would appreciate it. My name is Paul Eldridge. I live in Windy Hills. I do live outside the city. And I guess my big concern is the U-turn at Main Street. There's nothing to stop the traffic coming from this way from the firehouse to the right turn. They will not stop and let you throw. So you're going to be backing traffic up coming in town on Capitol Trail, unless you stop traffic somehow. Secondly, you've done a good job with the two turn lanes on, from Library Avenue on to Cleveland Avenue. You're gonna put a crosswalk up at uh, uh, McKee's Lane, so you're gonna narrow the two lanes down to one lane by the time you get to McKee's Lane. What about the traffic that backs up coming out there because of the merge? I don't let somebody in, somebody else doesn't let somebody in. Now you've got traffic backed up. When that signal turns to McKee's Lane, you have about 10 cars that are gonna be allowed to come out onto Capitol Trail. The rest of the traffic, the only traffic that's gonna be moving is the ones that are coming to the right on Library Avenue. So then again, you, you're stopping traffic at McKee's Lane. Thank you. Moving on to Denise Boone, please. Uh, Denise Boone, Windy Hills, District 2. If you could go a little bit closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry. You can move I it. I not want to be too loud. <laughs> thank you for uh, being here and listening to us, and thank you for all your research um, and your theories. And theories are great until they're implemented with real humans. Um, I've lived there for 19 years and have experienced all in and out waves. One reason we don't utilize in a way often is because for the 19 years I've lived there, we have asked to have that light changed. And you sit there for five minutes to get three seconds to go through. Um, also, there are about 1,400 homes and four developments that are gonna be affected. Each of them with, uh, you know, about two cars each. So 2,800 cars, and if you go in to the rush hour in the morning and everybody's got to make a left out of Anna Way, how much gridlock do you think we're going to have? There's a lot of people you're affecting here. And then add buses and delivery drivers. Buses come in and out of, of Woodland Avenue all the time. Also, if we're tired or a lot of people are tired of waiting for that light at Anna Way, they're going to go up to the light Possum Park Road and make a right, which definitely backs up every day at rush hour. So let's add some more traffic and it's going to back it right on up to the Anna Way. I just don't feel that you've taken a lot of input from the people who live there. We are willing to work with everybody, but just don't cut us off. That's one way out, one way out, and it's just not right. 
You can extend the light times at rush hour. You can make a, put a pole light turning right off of East Cleveland Avenue so they don't just barrel through on a right turn and cause the accidents. You know, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Moving on to Michael Savakul, please. Mike Savakul, District 2. Thank you, everybody, for putting this meeting together. Matt, appreciate the talk we had last week. It was very informative. I appreciate seeing you again here tonight. Um, Go to the mic, please, <clears throat> if that's helpful. Hear me now? Okay. I just wanted to uh, ask this council and the mayor if you guys had a chance to review the links that I sent you earlier this week that gave you links to satellite imagery of different seagull intersections, which, aka the Florida T. And if you looked at the three key things that I kind of pointed out to you within that email were to look at the terrain, stability, and the residential aspects of where those intersections are placed. Because every one that I've looked at does not have the 20 drive, it does not have the six cross streets that are coming in downstream of where one of these intersections is, especially for the continuous flow direction of traffic. Um, I just bought my house two years ago, well, probably one of the newest residents in the room. It was not a decision I made lightly. I sat on Orch Lane for probably about three weeks. I'd go up there at night directly from work just to see what the traffic was like, knowing the only way in or out of my property was to be making a right-hand turn or a left-hand turn in with the flow of traffic on Capitol Trail there. It, knowing that that light was there, seeing brakes in traffic on the regular was one of the key reasons that I even put the bid in on the house. And since then, I've done probably about ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 worth of improvements to that property to make it more livable. So it's just, it seems, I get all the benefits, but quite frankly, I have to sit in traffic for an extra five, six minutes because I'm directly affected by all that stuff to each night when I'm home from work. I'm happy to sit in the traffic and I shrug my shoulders with everybody on their phones not paying attention to the drive, which is a bigger issue, not trying to put a fix in that isn't gonna fix that. Thank you. Hey, Michael, moving on to Nancy. Nancy Bailey, please. My name is Nancy Bailey. Please excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold, so this may be a little hard to understand. What my neighbors have said so far is very true, but we live on 151 Capitol Trail, which is on the north side of Capitol Trail. My main uh, problem seeing the traffic is how it backs up in the evening. And it did, it did that to a certain extent before the improvement of Cleveland Avenue. But once that improvement was done, it got worse, a lot worse. It was as if the lights weren't coordinated enough to allow the traffic to flow better. And it has been hellacious trying to get home from uh, say the Wilmington direct door, um, uh, driveway. And that goes with for my brother, my sister-in-law, and my, all my other neighbors that all live on that northbound side. So all these improvements, you're talking about Woodlawn, and you're talking about Cleveland, but yet I haven't heard that much about the flow from say, as from what I can see, from when hills passed our house under the bridge there's there's something wrong with the lights that don't allow more of a flow 
there's a tremendous population in the area, so I know the cars, the amount of cars is going to keep increasing. And a second here and a second here, I don't see how that's going to help, and I don't understand how cutting off of Woodlawn is going to help our neighbors across the road. It just doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, they need a, ways to get in and out, and I agree with um, my neighbor who said those um, hills that go down in the winter are treacherous and that Woodlawn exit is flat and you don't have as much trouble with the ice. And I worry about um, what I call unintended consequences. You did address the fact that if there are more accidents and things, you could, you could undo the intersection, which is fine, but there's always unintended con consequences and human beings, and I don't see how this is gonna solve as much as you think it might. Thank you, Nancy. Move on to Michelle Kelly, please. I'm Michelle Kelly, otherwise known as a new improved Michelle McCann. Michelle Kelly. And first of all, a big thank you very much to WRA for listening to everything we said last time and for making some some uh, crunching all the numbers and some major data. You know, each one of us, all of us here in this room have had to make our peace. Michelle, living I need you to go back highway. to, Michelle. So thank you very much everyone for all the hard work. Michelle, doing. giving you a warning, you need to go back to that or you will be removed from the meeting. You're disrupting the meeting, you need to stay. Thank you. Thank you again for crunching the data, thank again. Uh, city Council, everyone for doing your hard work, I appreciate it. And uh, we have seen through the graphic representations that accidents and automobile incidents have been produced. Thank you, the solutions implemented worked, that's great. We are here though for the Florida Tea. Around the year 2010 or so when Kirkwood Highway was surfaced at that time, the traffic lights were changed, signal duration and direction, creating a problem that persists to this day. The daily backups exist because the traffic signal on east and westbound Kirkwood Highway, that's under the train bridge intersection, does not allow traffic to flow both days simultaneously. That was not the case prior to the approximately 2010 Kirkwood Highway resurfacing project. So consider this. During the afternoon peak rush hour, traffic flow from Route 2 on Cleveland Avenue is stopped for the duration while the other traffic is flowing. So eastbound and westbound literally stop. The light is red. Why? Standing there timing it, it's red for approximately 30 seconds, oh, about, about mid-morning. And that's interesting because your slide showed that 20,000 trips a day go through the flight and to alleviate the traffic backup, the governing body here is ready to approve the Florida Tea at Woodlawn Avenue. This would actually eliminate the 10 second Woodlawn traffic light duration that only occurs when there are cars that actually trip the signal. So now consider this, the solution is taking a small, tight intersection, introducing a new concrete island and making it even smaller. The pedestrian crosswalk signal will make, take significantly longer than the 10 second Woodlawn traffic light duration. So, very, very simply, um, putting aside traffic studies, let's let common sense argue that allowing Kirkwood Highway traffic flow simultaneously eastbound and westbound gives an additional 30 seconds to alleviate intersection congestion every rotation. Thank you, Michelle, your time has expired. Please have a seat. Thank you. Moving on to Jim Kelly, please. Thank you. Jim Kelly, 314 Capitol Trail. I'm certain that I am the only resident in the city of Newark who drives 35 miles an hour on Kirkwood Highway from Cleveland Avenue to where I turn right on Ash Avenue. <laughs> Except for me.
Not working? No, there we go. Okay. So uh, that's one thing, but the, uh, the traffic coming up behind me as I slow down to turn on Ash Avenue is pretty aggressive. What's even worse, though, is trying to turn onto Kirkwood Highway from Ash Avenue to take a right turn. The only time you can make that turn safely is when there's a gap in the traffic when the light at Cleveland Avenue is red. So I, I, I can't possibly see how that's going to prove with any uh, green, all green heading north. Now, there was one of the other questions I had was, uh, I know with the hotel, they talked about off-site parking and shuttle bus service. Does anybody know where that location is? I don't know. Just curious as to what impact that would have. And also, was the area-wide study fee from the hotel ever paid of my CAC was $5,700. I have no, no record of that. Those are my questions and comments, and thank you. Jim? Uh, Diane Akins, please. I'm Diane Akins, and I live at 107 Trout Stream Drive in Lars Glen. Um, I oppose the installation of the Florida Tea. I'm concerned regarding the safety of the residents. Um, we are now going to be asked to go down and make a U-turn at the intersection of 273 and Capitol Trail, which has more traffic congestion and will increase time on our commute to go east. Also, we're going to have the hotel and more uh, increased congestion. Also, going east on Capitol Trail, we're, now, we're going to have to quickly try to get to the left lane so we can make a U-turn at Anna's Way to go back to our homes. Um, another issue is this bus pull-off. That's going to be an accident waiting to happen because with the constant flow of traffic and the bus is going to try to get in and I can see accidents happen in there. Um, also, the, the people in Windy Hills on that side, getting out of their um, driveways, that's going to be, a, you know, an issue, and there can be some more accidents there. So these are safety issues and um, concerns that I have. All right. Thank you for being here tonight, Diane. Todd Ruckel, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I've had two people seat time: Joe McGinnis and Merrill. So I Joe to Merrill, please raise your hands. Thank you. Go ahead, Todd. All right, before I do my prepared uh, remarks, I just want to ask a couple questions. Do you need the Florida T to complete the approval project that City Council approved? Do you need the Florida T to do that? No. Okay. Am I also clear to say that it was the Cleveland Avenue, the 14 people on that committee, that were is kind of made you do the Florida T or wanted or the idea for you to do it. You didn't come up with the idea on your own. The, the idea was, the idea has been out there for years like we talked about in the beginning. Uh, we did not, I, my <coughs> recollection was we did not present it as an idea to the committee that through conversations with the committee about traffic congestion at this location, it was generated through that process. It wasn't something that we presented and said, we want to do this. It was generated through the committee. I don't, I don't remember exactly how it came up, but it, it wasn't something we came in predisposed to. Okay. How many of those accidents have I seen that greatly reduced from 2015? How many of those were fatal accidents? Do the police know? Anybody here? I, I believe it's zero because of the speed limit slow. But that's, you, you, it was a, there was a depth, it was a bad intersection before you made the changes. And those changes were very good. And I think everyone appreciates that. Now, I've been doing a lot of studies on this Florida T. Um, you, uh, would you agree that the only time these lights fail are during the rush hour in the morning and the rush hour in the evening? It's not just an hour anymore. It's several hours. Um, when, they, when they fail in the evening, they, they reach a F as in Frank type of grade probably um, toward the tail end of you know, three o'clock into four o'clock, and then 
you know, it, it's just, it's several hours of a failing grade. And right, but, but out of a general day, you're talking maybe three to four hours out of the day where this, this is a failure. That's, that's what this is all about, those three to four hours a day. That and the crash trends that are consistent throughout kind of the entire right, which day have, along the corridor. Which have been greatly reduced since the changes in 2015. How many accidents have there been since the double left has been put on Woodlawn since, I guess it was put on about it less than a year ago? Do we have any data on that? So the crashes have not decreased since 2015. That's this slide here. So it hasn't increased, okay. Along the corridor, and then in terms of the crashes specific to the, to the here's, double. here's before 2015, there's the single left, but there's the double left. So we still see crash patterns. Okay, but we don't know if it's from the double, from the exact double left that was put in that has not caused any more accidents. It's it's still a contributing crash pattern. So it's still the same. It hasn't increased. That's what I'm saying. Okay. It, it's increased with respect to 2015. It's that's a new crash pattern. Okay. So before in that instance we had two eastbound yeah, right that's turns. Cleveland Avenue. We had two eastbound right turns. So versus this is westbound two, left turns. So, so you have two accidents in a, in a year. No, that's this is prior to 2015. So that's right, just I'm, January of 2000. I'm just getting sorry. frustrated. It, it's from the time the double left was put in, how many accidents have taken place? That's this slide. So you're talking, what is that? Three, five, seven, so 12, 13 accidents. And we have 20,000 occurrences a day that go through there. That's what you're saying? 50,000? Okay. All right, we don't have an issue. That's what this means. All right, we have no fatal crashes. Florida T, what was the other thing? What is it going to cost the taxpayers to reverse this if you do put it in? How much are you talking about? Don't know, don't know offhand. All right, so it's cost 300000 to put it in. It, it would probably be a little less, but you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to make the change. You, you would at least yeah, give me a range. I would say that's a, a fair range, is that it would be less than the install, but it would be you know, in the hundreds of thousands. Okay, we also do have a business over there. It's Kirk Flowers, uh, Councilman Markham, and a lot of people do use that in the area. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Todd Ruckel, District 2. I'm one of the three team leads for the largest real estate team in Delaware for Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. A real estate expert, I want to discuss the terms, call, the term called external obsolescence. This term means something not on the property that is negatively affecting the property values. Could be a home on a main road, it could be noise pollution, a water tower, high power tension lines. We're only having one exit for over a thousand homes in over a four mile radius. It is my expert opinion that if this exit is taken away, the homes will depreciate between 5 and 10%. With over 1,000 homes affected an average sale price of $250,000, the homeowner losses of equity will be between 12.5 and $25 million. There is no question that this is a taking by the government. After a class action lawsuit filed in federal court and the homeowners will win the case, the city of Newark and the state of Delaware we need to compensate each homeowner, homeowner, and I want to be clear, it's not just the right side, it's going to be the left side. Laura's Glen, Stafford 1, Stafford 2, Windy Hills, Presswick Farms, Lumbrook, Gilberti Lane, and all homes on the side of Kirkwood Highway, which ultimately, ultimately will be back, will be, have to be paid back by the Delaware taxpayers. The next issue, next, next issue is police and ambulance response. Aetna confirmed ambulance will, will go right to Christiana Hospital. However, in cases of trauma for children accidents, the ambulances will go down Woodlawn and out 273 to 95 to AI DuPont Hospital. When my daughter was attacked, this was the exact route the driver uh, took. God forbid if a police officer is in Lumbrook and a call comes out of the ma a mass shooting in Newark Charter or Elkton Road, the intersection will be completely unsafe for a police to go lights and sirens trying to go out the in lane on Woodlawn. And you can see that through the barriers that they're putting up. They will need to go down Attaway, which will add almost three miles to a response time. This will add many minutes to a scene where every second matters. The next topic is who pays for the roads? As you may be aware, every driver pays for a significant, uh, 
significant Delaware and federal get, pays a federal a significant Delaware and federal tax to support the creation and maintain, maintain maintenance of the roads. Now, our founding fathers fought against taxation without representation. Now, ironically, we've come full circle. Now we have representation without taxation. There is not one proposal on the table to tax the cyclists for the fair mark for the fair their fair share of the roads uh, for this bike. It will be the driving supermajority paying for a bike path that the vocal minority is screaming for. Finally, I want to talk as a neighbor who has lived in a neighborhood from 1996 on Adeline Avenue. I want you all to envision you are at Woodlawn and Cleveland, Cleveland Light and you're in your car. This is the gateway to all of Newark for the affected neighborhoods. Now pretend you're a human body. Your head is looking out toward Cleveland Avenue. You know you can go straight and go to Pennsylvania or Maryland. Your left arm can go to Main Street. It can go to 72 toward the beach. Or it can make a left and go to 273 to get to 95. Your right arm, your right arm goes to Wilmington. So this proposal will cut off your left arm, it'll cut off your head, and all you have is your right arm, and right is going to go right. They will not go to support the businesses on Main Street. They will not support the businesses on Cleveland Avenue. They will not support the city that does not want them to be a part of it since you are taking their gateway away. So to sum this up, please do not take the millions of dollars in equity away from these homeowners. Please do not dramatically increase the police, fire, and ambulance response times, which may cost our neighbors lives. Please do not represent the cyclist minority over the driving supermajority, and let your neighbors know you care about them and want them to be part of the city. Please let them keep their leg, their left arm, and their head. Please let them know you're worth more than a bike path in 12 seconds. Show them you are part your time of your neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Rocco, please. Hi, Maria Ruckel, District 216, Adeline Avenue, wife of this one. Um, I, too, am a realtor for Berkshire Hathaway uh, Home Services for the last 14 years. Uh, while I appreciate the goals of this project, uh, the impact will be squarely felt on the homeowners of Stafford, Windy Hills, Lumbrook, Presswick Farms, and Laura's Glen. Um, and that is negatively affecting voting, tax-paying homeowners in these Newark neighborhoods. Not all these other people that drive through Newark. Um, you know, and property values, it was, it was brought up by this gentleman. Um, there's definitely going to be an influence on property values. If you drive along Woodlawn Avenue now, people are already preemptively putting their homes on the market because they're so fearful of this going through. Um, most definitely traffic. When you have small children, all that traffic running past your house definitely has an impact. Um, one egress going westbound out of a neighborhood is insane. Um, as a resident, I drive this stretch. I drive out of there every single day, multiple times a day. Uh, when this was first announced, I said, okay, I'm going to see how bad it is. I went out on a way for a few days just trying to see. I'd go out that light and I would sit because it was backed up past the light when the signal would turn. And I would invariably sit a couple cycles waiting until the traffic going into Newark uh, would change. Um, and, you know, it's going to affect our property values, our safety, our quality of life, our patronage of our downtown businesses. All to few, save a few seconds of time, mostly for these people that are just passing through. Um, neighbors are feeling pushed out. They're feeling as if they don't matter to the city leadership. Uh, please don't make our voting Newark residents the sacrificial lamb for this project. Moving on to Kathy Lank Lankford. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, she does want to talk. That's her name down by the state. Thank you, sir. Lisa Cleese. Yes. Say pass. Yes. Thank you. Corinth Ford, please. Good evening, my name is Corinne Ford. I live at 132 Capitol Trail. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment, which we feel as residents that you are attacking and taking away from us. The reason this elicits such an emotional response 
is that you are attacking our homes. You are attacking the residential character of our neighborhood by turning Kirkwood Highway into an extension of I-95. I come home every night down 273 and make that right-hand turn. It takes me about three minutes from the time I pass the fire hall to get into my driveway. I don't find that an inordinate amount of time. I can't get excited about eliminating a 200 second delay. Where you see traffic patterns, I see people. People who have invested their lives in their homes. People who have made that their primary investment. And now you are devaluing our property. That is a serious blow to me. I've worked 25 years to pay off my mortgage and secure my retirement. And you are trying to take that from me. You are destroying the quality of life in the neighborhood, and I won't even be able to get enough from my home to move someplace else. Instead of a $300,000 boondoggle and an elaborate scheme to address a problem that happens two hours a day from four to six, there is minor traffic congestion, and it is minor. I come from New York, please. This is nothing. <laughs> I've been on the I-95 for an hour by the time I get home, so a minute at that light is nothing. But not being able to make a left-hand turn to shop at the Acme on Saturday when there is no congestion. This council person made a very good point. The most abhorrent point of this is being barricaded into our neighborhood and cut off from the rest of Newark. So please, you would not want to this for yourself if you lived here and shame on anyone who votes yes for this. Thank you. I want to remind you that you, when you come to the podium, you are speaking to counsel. DelDot is facilitators in this, so when you come to the podium, you need to direct your comments to counsel, please. Moving on to Bill Just. My name is Bill Just. I live at 501 Woodlawn Avenue at the corner of Woodlawn and Elm. I've been a resident there since 1966, January. I'd like to address something that hasn't been discussed, at least as I've heard it. From the standpoint of Spring Hill Suites, I see rights in and rights out on 273, rights in and rights out on Kirkwood Highway. So that means people will be entering Spring Hill coming from the east or coming from the south. When they've completed their stay, they'll have to return most generally to the east or the south. In order to do that, they'll have to take a right on Kirkwood Highway and they will head north on Kirkwood Highway, probably being given directions by Spring Hill because people will wanna know, how do I get the heck out of here? So they'll be directed to go down option one, two lights, and do a U-turn at Anna's Way and come back the other direction. Option two, go down to two lights, Anna's Way, take a right, go up about 100 yards, do a U-turn, come back down to Anna's Way, take a left, and head back into town. The third option, which I believe people <coughs> will ultimately discover, is just go one light, turn right on Woodlawn Avenue, go down two thirds of a mile, take a quick left, another left onto Anna's Way, and come back. This is going to dramatically increase traffic on Woodlawn Avenue from people exiting not only the restaurant, but residents, temporary residents uh, for Spring Hill. I was directly involved with the initiative to try to stop Woodlawn Avenue being connected to Windy Hills a number of years ago. We were overruled on that. Windy Hills wanted their light. Our area wanted its light. I ask you not to overrule the will of the people in this case. There have been a lot of good arguments presented, but every time you turn to a situation created by the presence of Spring Hill Suites, it's a negative for the residents on Capitol Trail and on Woodlawn Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. John Mayer. My wife has seated her time for the, me. Oh, she has. Okay. State your name, record, please. John Mayer, 7 Ash Avenue. 
I've lived, uh, or not lived, I've been at Kirk Flowers for 52 years. Uh, what we're talking about tonight is trading off uh, time uh, for safety, maybe death. All the time we're going to save with the Florida T uh, will be gained by the people up uh, in the other side of town or living in Landenburg or Maryland or whatever. The time lost will be by all the people in the three neighborhoods doing U-turns in a quarter mile out of the way, this way, that way. Uh, but while they're doing that, they're putting their lives in danger. If uh, you don't believe me, tonight on the way home, uh, the, the city of Newark police, uh, one of their favorite plots, plots to set up their radar is right on the Kirkwood Highway. They can catch probably every person going up the Kirkwood Highway. And with uh, con a continuous green, it just gives them a running start. So now they're gonna be flying along even faster and the people trying to get out of their driveways or not necessarily even out of their driveways, out of Ash Avenue, out of Orchard, all those streets, you better be quick or you might be dead. And now if you live on the uh, westbound Kirkwood Highway uh, and you're, you want to make a U-turn, you've got to go into by the post office right out here and try to make a U-turn in a area where you'll probably get hit. You better not have a big, big car or big truck or anything with a trailer on it uh, and try to make this U-turn out here, there's a real good chance you get hit. So you'll probably go up the path mark and go into the parking lot there and turn around and come out. Now that's one thing. So you're inconveniencing everybody that lives in this part of the thing to make everybody happy on that side of town. Now, the big thing is when the accident happens at Anaway, Anaway, South Doe, when the accident happened there, and living out here at Running Kirk for all those years, we've seen some really big accidents happen there. You didn't have that step, did you? But when it does happen, and it only takes a few minutes for the, the traffic on the Kirkwood Highway to back up, and then everybody thinks up here, see that traffic back up, they can get around it by going down Woodlawn. They'll go down Woodlawn and back it up because there'll be no way out. And they can't get the Kirkwood Highway, they can't get out Woodlawn, the side streets back up. So unless you have a helicopter, you're not going to be able to get anybody who's having a baby, heart attack, or anything else out of that development. So you're trading them off a few seconds, 100 seconds, 200 seconds, whatever it is, you're trading it off for somebody's life or for inconveniencing three whole neighborhoods of 1,700 houses so somebody can get home 100 seconds sooner. Think about it. We're gonna make those people happy by 100 seconds and that's going to be between four and six each day. We've got to live for this seven days a week, 24-7. Thank you. Thank you, John. Amy Rowe, please. My name is Amy Rowe. I live in District 4. I served on the Cleveland Avenue Task Force and I represented the Newark Branch NAACP. And I am here about the crosswalk. And I think it is a shame that there was no slide about the crosswalk in this presentation. And I think that it is a shame that no one from Del Dot or the city mentioned the crosswalk until my city councilman brought it up. And I think it is a shame 
that we have a situation here where the residents that live in the affluent neighborhoods of Woodlawn, et cetera, were all individually notified by the city about this meeting, but that the city did not bother to notify the residents that live in the affordable housing complex at Alder Creek. That is shameful. And it is also shameful that the city never bothered to notify the members of the task force. And I know that because I am one of them. Now we are in a situation where we have had a housing development, first public housing and now affordable housing, that has had to cross traffic at Cleveland Avenue for 60 years. People are hit by cars, mothers pushing baby strollers across that traffic. And in order to get a reasonable crosswalk that is at the intersection, and we're all taught to cross the street at the intersection, we need to have the Florida T. This is what we were told at the task force, and this is what we were told tonight. This Florida T should be passed on that reason alone. We need to stop the time when we are discriminating against low-income communities and having them live in very dangerous pedestrian environments. And I am shocked by the behavior that I am seeing here tonight, and I really think that this meeting should have been handled much differently and that we should be seeing and prioritizing the issue of the crosswalk and pedestrian safety at the Alder Creek Affordable Housing Community. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Moving on to State Representative Ed Ozinski, please. Madam Mayor, City Council, good evening. Um, I'm Ed Ozinski, I am not a city resident, but I do represent uh, Lumbrook, Stafford, one and two, and Windy Hills. Um, I do ask that you listen to these residents and consider their comments. Um, I am happy that the Del Dot and the city has worked along with many of the residents to answer their questions and prove all the factual data. They've run additional data uh, d through our asking and they've made some changes. And I'm happy to hear that the plan is still conceptual uh, if approved. One change, though, that was brought up, I was a little disappointed, and if, may I, if I may ask, Matt, could you bring up the Anna Way slide? Um, they're showing two double lefts coming out. I think it would be imperative if besides just the two double lefts coming out of Anna Way that there was a, would be a dedicated right turn also added to this exit. Um, with the two double lefts, if somebody's in the right lane making a left, they're gonna be backing up anybody trying to make a right. So I would like to, uh, I don't know if the council can do that through an amendment to this plan or since the plan is still a conceptual plan, I will continue, if this is voted for to move ahead, I will continue to advocate for a third lane there because that property is not private, I believe it is public property. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Larry Cordero, Cordero, please. Did I say that correctly? Mm -hmm. My name is Larry Cordero. I live in Windy Hills for 30 years. I'm outside of the city limits. Glad that you'll listen to what I have to say. And it's about safety. Everybody's talked about pedestrian safety, safety on merging on this new Florida T, and the T in Florida T means turbo. City of Newark knows the speed limit. City of Newark also knows how fast people are going by the speeding tickets that you see. And it's not 35, they're going 50 or faster because I see them passing me. Those people who live with their driveways facing Kirkwood Highway either direction are doomed. They'll never get in and out. That's all I have to say. Thank you for being here. Debbie Justice Sarver, please. Correct. My Go ahead. Your name is Bill Sarver. I'm My name is Bill Sarver. 
I'm the third house on the right as you go through the intersection at Woodlawn going towards Wilmington. Before my wife and I bought our house on Capitol Trail 25 years ago, we considered the pros and cons. And as a man said earlier, the one major concern that we had was the traffic. The deciding factor for us when we bought our house was the red light. If there wasn't a red light 25 years ago, we never would have bought that house. With that being said, over the years, it used to be harder to exit the driveway. The lights used to be, they weren't synchronized like they were now. There, there was less traffic. When we tried to get out of our driveway, the light was green longer <coughs> coming out of Newark. There was a green arrow and a green arrow. North and back, south down were both green at the same time. Since they synchronized the lights the way that they are now, we have a nice safe buffer to get out of our driveway. Uh, I'm, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm angry and I'm really, really working hard to contain my anger here tonight. Okay? We have fewer accidents on our section of the road now. You can check the statistics and you can see. It seemed like every other week someone was being involved in an accident down at Cleveland Avenue and Woodlawn and Capitol Trail. Okay, now there are some accidents. He said they're about the same, but those accidents are due to the cars that are making a right-hand turn coming off of Cleveland Avenue. Because we have a very short window coming off of Woodlawn to make that left. Seven seconds. The accidents that are occurring there now or because of the boneheads that are making a right when they're not supposed to be making that right. I, I gotta tell you, I, I, I can't even read from what I have wrote here. I'm so angry. Wait until the night comes when somebody's coming towards that underpass at 50 miles an hour and they hit somebody that's crossing Kirkwood Highway towards Cleveland Avenue. And they knock them out of their shoes and they send them sailing 150 feet in the air. It'll be a miracle if they're not dead when they hit the ground. About a month ago I heard that one of the managers from one of the car dealerships was clocked doing 71 miles an hour up by Anna's way. Imagine if he was clocked in between Poplar and Orchard because he was probably doing 100 when he went past there. Every single day, every day, I see cars pass my driveway in excess of 70 miles an hour. Not every car, obviously. Your time is up. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. Debbie, please. I live at 122 Capitol Trail. And I, felt, I kind of felt like I wanted to give you my time because you, what you put out there was so much better than what I have to say and most of it's been said. But I just, I can't believe that anybody would even consider the Florida Tea as a viable option at this location. I think everyone is looking for a cheap way to fix the traffic problem in this area. You want to put a Band-Aid on and the blood is going to spill around it. You're putting my family and everyone else on the road in danger. And here, I did not have to tell you where I live first. I live at 122 Capitol Trail, and the cars already speed by my house constantly. The police regularly sit down the street, and the radar catches speeders. And now I also in, wanted to put in there, you're talking about slowing the cars down with this Florida T thing, putting your barrier and stuff in there. Well, you know what happens when you do something like that? When the people get through, the thing that irritates them, that slowed them down, is they take off like a bat out of hell. And that's exactly what will happen. And somebody will get hurt there. Uh, there are, I mean, motors, there are some motorcycles that fly there that I think they have to be doing the, the, 
Japanese kind, I don't know what they're called. I seriously, they've got to be doing well over 100. And we live with this. I have a grandson that I'm raising. Um, I, I don't even let him walk out to by the highway by himself at all. And he's going to be 11 years old. He is not allowed out there to walk, to go around to the park or anything by himself. He's not allowed to go stand out there and wait for the school bus. I make him stay up from the highway because it's not safe there. Cars, we had a car that flew into a telephone pole right in front of where we lived before and, and bent the telephone pole. Um, it's, it's not as safe place as it is now. And you're only talking about making it worse. And I really, really have no faith. And I, I mean, I understand like a little bit more now, but I lived here for 61 years. And 50 years ago, the exit that is was at, it was an AMP, I believe, at the time, was closed because it was not safe for it to, the traffic to enter on that curve there now where the hotel is. <laughs> and then you put that exit back in. I can't have any faith in anybody that would, the amount, the traffic has increased in the years since then, would go and put something that was closed due to safety factor back then, back in. Okay. Um, oh, we sat out there the other night and counted cars, two nights in a row for about an hour and a half, a little bit over that. Every 2.7 seconds. Can you go to the microphone, please? Pardon me? Oh, Let's go to the sorry. microphone. Sorry, I was Thank looking you. at you guys thinking it. Every 2.7 seconds, cars are going by ours, is what it averaged out to when we counted the cars for an hour and a half. Now, if they're not stopping, you tell Your me the heck expired. I'm ever going to get out of there. Huh? Thank you, Debbie. Your time is expired. Thank oh, you. Oh, I didn't see any of the time. Yeah. They were there. All right, Sam Presley. My name is Sam Presley. I live at 241 Campbell Trail. I'm not for this Florida tea at all because it helps me not at all. I have to use the jug handle down there to make a turn to go to work. And I use it at least twice a day. And I use both jug handles on each end of the street there. And I live right on the highway, so I'm not for it at all. Thank you. Thank you for being here too, Sam. This next name I'm having difficulty reading. Uh, name is Pat. Is there more than one Pat in the room? Last name begins with a G, I believe. Grammel or Gramet Grametti? Can you read? Is there a gay G A Y L E? No Gail or Pat. All right, we will move on then. How about 114 Trout Dream? We're definitely moving on. Uh, Alfred, it looks like, Lamb, 301 Capitol Trail. Anyone here from 301 Capitol Trail? All right, we will move on. Tom Parkins, please. Tom Parkins. I'm uh, also on the uh, <clears throat> city uh, traffic committee Been there for a decade and served on the Cleveland Avenue task force. And I thank you for um, your time tonight and making this a special meeting. Um, the model says that we will save a minute or two for the cars passing through this intersection. Who benefits from that minute or two? The residents of Pike Creek, the residents of Mill Creek moving up Crookwood Highway, they are the ones who will benefit from the Florida Tea. Who do you represent? You represent the citizens of Newark. Continue. Your time is in place. So you have to take into consideration who will benefit from that Florida tea. I would like to also point out two things that have not fully been addressed here tonight. Uh, Mr. Buckley did a fine job. Uh, the U-turn there at the post office. He showed the cars and an ambulance. But what about delivery trucks? What about school buses who have to make that 
can no longer can make that left into um, Woodlawn Avenue, now they will have to make a U-turn at the post office. A school bus is not going to be able to do that. Delivery trucks are not going to be able to do that. Pedestrian crossing at Woodlawn. This pedestrian crossing is dangerous. Matt, maybe I don't know if you can flip back to the Florida T picture there. But take a, somebody crossing over from Lumbrook into wanting to go where? To McDonald's, to Main Street. What do we have to do now? Well, currently, right now, there's just a single crossing parallel to the bridge. Now you have to go to the, to the island in the middle, then cross over to Porter Chevy, then you have to cross Cleveland Avenue. Our teenagers are not going to do that. They're going to what? Dart right across or try to climb up on the railroad bridge and down. It's an unsafe crossing the way it's designed. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Tony Longo, please. All right, Yvonne, you make. Is Tony, are you seating time or no? We're just, we just All right, thank you. Yvonne Longo, I live at 5 Elm Avenue, lived there for 27 years. Um, first off, I definitely oppose this, and so do most of my neighbors on my street, and they didn't come because they figured your minds are made up and there's no point in coming, which is sad. But we all think it's not safe. It's not safe for the crosswalk reasons. I would never walk halfway across that and wait for a light and go halfway again and go again. I think that's like a death wish. I couldn't do it. <laughs> not safe for drivers, it's not safe for people who live on the Kirkwood Highway, Capitol Trail, whatever. It's just an accident waiting to happen so many times. It's a waste of money, all this money being spent, and then if it gets shown to be that it's not good, it has to be removed, waste of money again. I don't understand that. It's not right that all of us who live in that area have to pay the consequences of having a Florida tea to lock us in our neighborhood, which is dangerous in case there's a chemical hazard like there has been before, with the problem on the railroad tracks. Six neighborhoods, how many thousands of people stuck trying to leave from one place? That's a really bad idea, poor idea. And about the accidents and the crashes, there's a lot of inattentive drivers. People are playing on their cell phones. I don't think having this Florida T and making people go faster is gonna make it a better situation. I think it's gonna make it a worse situation. It's unsafe for people that live in this neighborhood now with people driving through crazy and fast. I can't imagine if people want to come cutting through now, when you do something like this, or traffic backs up like someone else has suggested, what about our children? What about our pets? What about us? It's more dangerous. Oh, this is supposed to be safer. I don't think any of this is safer. Common sense says it's not safer. And also, if this passes, we are the ones who vote for our officials, correct? And we are the ones who patronize Newark. Well, guess what? Me and my family and all my neighbors, the ones that are opposed to this, I don't think you'll see any of us trudging into Newark to give our business. I'll go out of my way to another city to give my business. And we will vote. Thank you, Yvonne. Sandy, <laughs> Sandy at 107 at Avenue, please. Thank you. Some finally did that. Thank you. I'm on the super short end of short, so. Um, well, I wasn't really sure what to anticipate. But please, please name in your, uh, um, where you live. Thank you. Sorry. Sandy Tedeschi. Uh, I live on Ash Avenue. Um, so I come out and I had to, like, you know, check out all the scoop. You know, I heard what he said, and I was kind of like, all right, he's making some good points. Um, you know, and I've heard what you all have said back here, and, wow, well, I don't know. Not sure I know what I think about it, but um, super inconvenient, I think, really. Like, I can't make a left off of Cleveland on Kirkwood Highway now. Like, that's crazy. Um, so anyway, so I'm sitting back there, and I'm thinking, can we put a circle in? It'll keep everything moving, and we can still make a left. Um, obviously, that's not going to fit on the footprint that's there. I don't even think that's a possibility, but that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Chuck? At one Poplar Avenue, please. <laughs> My name 
name is Chuck Bio. We live on One Poplar Avenue, Lumbrook, city of Newark. I've lived there for the past 34 years. Um, appreciate the work the city council has done over those 34 years. Uh, a lot of efforts gone in to promoting the city of Newark as a university town, as a destination town. Uh, that does not come easy. However, what has resulted in that is an increase in traffic. Throughout the city boundaries, traffic has just increased, increased, increased. Um, like somebody said, there's a cost for everything. Let me see if I can get this back. The proposed Florida T, and I, I mentioned, I say proposed, and I think it is in the proposal stage. Nothing is being jammed down our throats to make this happen, I don't think. Um, so it is a proposal. I'm against the proposal. My wife's against the proposal. It does not benefit the residents of Prestwick, Stafford, Windy Hills. It in fact penalizes them and rewards non-residents, as somebody just mentioned, passing through. My main concerns are, are safety concerns, and I know there's a lot of data been presented by DelDOT, and it's statistical data. Uh, it may not be, <clears throat> it may look good on, on paper and on spreadsheets, but it, it, it's not reality. I see people, people that live on, Kerp, on Capitol Trail having to exit or in, uh, their properties, that's accident prone. Um, they mentioned the dark bus stop being a, a turnoff, or, or, and that's a good thing. What about the school buses? What about the school buses in those developments, how would they affect heard bus at all? Um, they're, they're, the speed limit enforcement, something that uh, if, if this goes through, what is the speed limit going to be in that right-hand lane, uh, permanent green? And um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck, for being here. Cheryl Berry, please. Cheryl Berry. Thank you for not being repetitive. We appreciate it. Verna at 34 Capitol Trail. Is Verna here? Yes. getting things together. Am I on? You're good. Okay. State your name, please. I'm um, Verna Garvin, and I'm at 134 Capitol Trail. That's the left side of Capitol Trail. Um, there are a few things. I know everybody is giving some wonderful, some wonderful remarks, and uh, I am not for the Capitol, or the, the Florida T. Um, but I wanted to mention a couple of things that I've researched on. And one they say that um, anytime you have an intersection, you're going to have con points of conflict. And so that uh, you have to have, it, it's, it's a safety feature, a safety factor, intersections are a safety factor nation, nationally, statewide, and local. Um, uh, the one thing that well, a couple things I wanted to mention. There's limited site stopping distance as far as this Florida T is concerned. Also, the intersection site distance is substandard, which I think was brought up as one of the people over here. Um, the Florida T is a step above traditional unsignalized traffic. And it was mentioned in one of the things that I read that uh, Florida T is actually more beneficial in a rural 
situation, not in this type of situation. And also that um, in, in this Florida T, when you look at 73 and you look at capital material, in your mind's eye, if you're familiar with 273, actually it's not just Library Avenue, it's 273 and Library Avenue coming into that intersection. And Capitol Trail goes around the curb northbound, goes around the curb and also goes up the grade. So there are points that you cannot see. And if there's an accident ahead or a pedestrian ahead that starts across um, the traffic without getting a light or something, that those are human factors that can cause an accident. And a Florida T does not eliminate accidents. It just slows down traffic in one way and speeds it up in another. And the side of the highway that I live on, um, it is impossible to come out of my driveway or will be even more so if that flow through traffic passes my house. Um, people that have to pull in and out of the driveways on the north side of the road, their driveway openings are not wide enough. And this was something that they put in the last time they, they put in new sidewalks. They are not wide enough for people without stopping to turn into the driveway. So if they have to stop, then you're going to have backed up traffic and problems are going to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Verna. Bridget Murray. Hello, my name is Bridget Murray and I have the 206 Capitol Trail and I am eastbound traffic and a lot of things I wrote down um, have already been addressed about the light, um, continuous green, it does make it hard to get in and out of the driveway. Right now I depend on that light to turn red, luckily I have a little hill I can sit on so I can see the traffic, I can't see the traffic stop but I notice when the light turns red there's no more cars coming so I can get out of my driveway. Um, the thing I wanted to bring up was um, in the summertime, springtime, we do trailer boats so we can go fishing and crabbing and we do depend on that light um, so we can get that boat back in the driveway and get it out of the driveway, um, you know, come and going. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up is uh, when it snows, we get plowed in. <laughs> um, so I know that um, I, uh, you know, go up to the come back down and um, when the lights were uh, you know stopped on uh, you know one side and we can go one the other uh, it would be easy for me to um, wait for the light to turn red you know I could go in Woodlawn come out and sit right there till the light turned red and then red and then uh, come out get uh, back on Kirkwood Highway Capitol Trail to get to my home uh, I'd have to get into far lane so I could make the turn into my driveway so I don't bounce off the side. Concrete barrier to get in my driveway. That's if I could make it up because they plow us in. Snow, ice, it's horrible until we can get it ourselves shoveled out. Uh, and so there's just a couple of things that I wanted to bring up, you know, and why, you know, we didn't want the Florida Tea. All right, thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you, Bridget. Sharon at 212 Capital Trail, please. You're passing, thank you. Jack. Jack Carpenter at 16, Ad Adeline, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, Jack Carpenter, um, I grew up in, uh, on Adeline uh, Avenue in the city, currently live outside the city, um, so grew up in, Grew up in Stafford. Um, you know, I use I use this exit every, but always go out this exit. Um, the first thing I have to say is a comment earlier about um, how we're you know it's an affluent neighborhood. This isn't Greenville. We're working class. We we're here. This you know what does that have to do with strangling our access out of our neighborhoods and our safety? Um, Another point I would have to make is I really don't think that, you know, if we block off this, this exit, that people are gonna go to Newark 
we could easily go so many other places and not have to deal with this and not have to make all these U-turns and you know why am I going to go to Main Street? So many there's so many places I can go up and down Kirkwood Highway. Um, the cost? Why are we? Many people have made the point that you know we don't even know what the impact of what we've already done and we've already agreed upon what that's going to have. Why are we going to spend a half a million dollars? And then if we have to reverse it, what are we going to spend another quarter million dollars? Who, you know, we have to pay for this as taxpayers. I, I don't, I don't see the, I just don't, I don't see the benefit of this um, in that aspect. And um, and the values of the neighborhood, as um, as my mother and stepfather have said, the values of the neighborhood will be affected. I've I bought in. I've owned two properties in Stafford and recently sold both of them. Um, and I've already had complaints about what's gonna happen here. We had originally another agent that we worked with, they're already moving out of Windy Hills because they are worried if this passes, that is gonna go down. Um, so that's it, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Jack. Just a watch. Thank you. State Representative Paul Baumbach, please. Paul Baumbach, uh, Country Hills Drive, uh, one of the many single entrance exit neighborhoods in the city of Newark. Smart, safe, and save. Let's start with smart. Every weekday during the peak hour each morning, just one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, 5,750 vehicles encounter these two intersections. 96% of them will be clearly better off with proposed changes. 96%. Even for the neighborhoods in question, they will be better off. At worst, two minutes more to leave in the morning, three minutes faster to come home in the afternoon. That is a net gain. By approving this proposal, you're making life clearly better for drivers and passengers of 5,500 vehicles a day, 96%. The cost-benefit analysis is overwhelming. The proposal is smart, very smart. Safe. We have a fire station within one block of this intersection. How much safer will our roads and homes be once we eliminate the daily gridlock that cripples these first responders? Uh, th these neighborhoods are actually, I'm sorry, uh, sh sorry. Um, it's faster for the volunteers to reach the station, faster for the vehicles to go to the emergencies and to return to the station. This proposal makes our city safer, especially for those who live in these neighborhoods to serve by this fire station. Save, gridlock is an incredible waste. It wastes fuel, it increases pollution, it wastes time, a lot of time. The gridlock elimination enables 1,200 people, more when you consider the passengers, saving an hour a month for some who will be saving a half hour a week by this. While, what you're, while you're hearing, thank you very much, while you're hearing tonight from many residents of these three communities, they will be better off. They, and 20 times as many people will be benefiting an awful lot. Um, this proposal will save dramatic amounts of time for those who live and work and also uh, uh, come to the businesses in and around our city. The intersection is a serious problem and the proposal is a serious solution. Tonight, please separate fact from fiction. While the passions are understandably high tonight, the facts our this proposal is very good for our city. It is smart. It makes us safer. It saves a tremendous amount of time for ourselves and our neighbors. Please make our city better by approving this proposal. Thank you. Representative Obama, Anna at 105 South Dillwyn, please. Is Anna here? My name is Anna Siula. I live outside the city because I'm in the county, but I'm on South Dillwyn in Windy Hills. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that the current situation on Library Road there and Cleveland Avenue and Woodlawn and all that is much better now than it used to be. So we're lucky in that regard. That has been an improvement. 
I've lived in Windy Hills for 37 years and worked at the University of Delaware. So I've been there all the time. Um, whatever happens with this, I probably don't have really as much at stake as other people do because I do live in Windy Hills, which is all the way on the other end of this problem. But the two things that have definitely come up because of all this discussion, which I think is extremely important and impacts on everyone, is speed on Capitol Trail. I do 35 miles an hour. I've been even known to put cruise control on to take myself at 35 miles an hour when going down the slope, excuse me. Well, let me tell you, 35 miles an hour, I think the guy behind me is gonna be in my trunk any second. And it concerns me if I need to stop because maybe the car in front of me is turning into their driveway. The Newark police tried to regulate it with the speed trap that they have near Anna's way. And God bless the cops because they actually get out in the middle of the road and stop the speeder in the far lane to get them to pull on over. I think they're gonna get hit by a car one of these days. Something has to be done about the speed. So I don't know what you do. Making it 25 isn't gonna help. They're still gonna do 50. But perhaps putting up more signs that say 35 enforced by radar along that strip might make people who aren't as familiar with the road think a little bit about doing their 50 and 60 miles an hour. At Anna's Way, I wait several extra seconds before I make a left turn onto Capitol Trail because they run the red light there all the time. And I am not exaggerating, okay? So I take those couple extra seconds to look both ways, which saves me and the car behind me because I do do that. But it is a problem, the speed. The other thing is the icing conditions. Sometimes I go to Woodlawn because it is icy on Anna's Way and Dillwyn and I'll go all the way up that way because of the ice. So if you decide to do the Florida T, try to do something about the speed and do something about the icing that does occur in bad weather on Anna's Way and South Dillon because both of those roads are actually in the city limits and not in the county. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for being here tonight. Timothy Ferry, please. Tim Ferry here, 7 Gilberti Lane. Uh, Gilberti Lane is the little cul-de-sac right off of Anna Way that uh, everyone drives right past and doesn't recognize. We're four little houses in there, but we exist there. I have a, a one and three-year-old uh, children that I am raising here, and I think that this entire idea is uh, bad for everyone who lives in the affected neighborhoods. Lumbrook, Stafford, Windy Hills, and the other ones, which I, I missed the names that I heard earlier, uh, and I apologize for leaving you out. Um, Implementing this Florida T will have that effect for the landowning and uh, taxpaying citizens of si the city of Newark. Maybe the Florida T will produce a benefit for the traffic flow on Capitol Trail and Cleveland Avenue. But it Can you please go close to the mic for me? Thank or you. maybe move it up a little, you're kind of tall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe this will produce a, a benefit to the traffic flow through Woodlawn Avenue, Capitol Trail, uh, Cleveland Avenue. But at what expense? To the detriment of the people who actually live here. The schematics and the YouTube videos put up on the task force website are not as accurate as the people who drive these roads every day, the people who are talking to you tonight. We know what it really looks like. We know that there's maybe four people who actually walk across the uh, intersection there. They're uh, unfortunate enough to risk their lives to do that. I don't know who you're trying to convince to come across with this crosswalk or we're not interested in walking across to your car dealerships and I don't think the students are coming over into our neighborhoods to, to look around. I don't understand the purpose of this. Possibly some incentive for the new hotel, possibly some incentive for uh, Adler Creek, which I didn't even know what that was. I had to look it up. It's the uh, townhouse complex. It's wedged in between Chevr uh, Chevrolet dealer and the Nissan dealer. Don't know why anyone would want to live in a row of car dealerships. No nonetheless, revamped by the city of Newark in 2015, I think for somewhere in the teens of millions of dollars. When I drove through there, it looked about 50% empty. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it looked like to me. Don't know if this is some sort of incentive or amenity being offered in an effort to fill this uh, vacant property that's occupied by, or that's owned by the Newark Housing Authority. Nonetheless, I can't find one proponent of this idea who lives in the negatively affected areas. Everyone, in my opinion, everyone who stands to uh, benefit from this, who lives in uh, areas down Cleveland Avenue, Paper Mill Road, those areas, and even up Kirkwood Highway, they're not the ones who are 
30 seconds, thank you. They're not the ones who are uh, suffering from this. We are being punished to, to their detriment. It is absolutely not fair. I don't know the name of the guy, but there's an infamous Newark police officer who sits right there at Capitol Trail in Anaway every day and gets people. Ask his opinion about the safety of that intersection. You ever tried to make a U-turn there? It's impossible. I know you talked about extending or somehow making it possible. I don't see it working. There's about three cars or four cars that can fit in that U-turn lane. Please Thank don't do this to us. Thank you, Timothy. Dean Moore, please. Did you sign up? What's your name, please? Yes, nine minutes, Dean. Can I use your microphone? I'm going to get interviewed. If you would, please go back and use that microphone. Can I just put this one up there? Why, why can I use this one? It's the wireless microphone. It's too close together. You'll get interference. All right. Can you turn this one off? Dean, just we have available, please. Okay. I would appreciate it. All right, I'll just move back. How's that? Thank you. All right, so I'm here representing uh, Stafford 1, 2, Lumbrook, and uh, Crestwood Farms, and anybody else that lives in that neighborhood, and even a bunch of people in Windy Hills. Um, I'm, when, I'm the one to put up the sign. I'm the one to run around talking to people. We don't have anybody in our neighborhood that wants this thing. Nobody wants this thing. I want to thank you guys for being here too. And I know you guys don't do this for the money. You do it for because you care about Newark. You need to please use the other microphone, Dean. It's much more effective. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. Your time is ticking. All right. Please address Capitol. All right. Thank you. So anyways, thank you for being here. Appreciate you guys. Um, all right. Okay, where was that? Again, thank you for being here. Okay. Um, I want to say that we, th I have to read this at the nervous, so sorry about that, folks. And I'd like to be able to speak off the cuff, but I can't. All right, so uh, here we go. Um, I thought, all right, here we go. Secondly, I want to say that uh, I thought it was obvious that this whole issue would have been put to rest because, you know, we've had two meetings about this, and we also had a town meeting about this, and you can obviously see that we don't want this. Nobody wants this. The citizens don't want this. Okay, so I don't even know why we're here tonight. And I've talked to a bunch of council people, and most of the council people don't want it either. So you guys do a great job, and I don't mean to cut in on your work that you did. You guys do a wonderful job, but you know, I don't know. I think you should be working on something else. But anyways, um, okay. So anyways, uh, doesn't mean that okay. We don't need all right. Two count okay. Okay, we don't want these changes. It's very, very obvious that the dangers outweighs. Need you to hold the microphone to your lips, or we won't hear the you. Okay. That alone should be enough to uh, abort this whole uh, thing about the Florida kids. It's plain and simple to see. Eventually, someone's going to get hurt, and chances are, because New York's a small town, you're going to know the people. And when you know the people, you're going to have to live with that. It's going to be on your conscience for the rest of your life. Somebody will get hurt, whether it be today, tomorrow, next year, five years from now, and then you're going to say, "Oh, geez, who did this thing?" All right. This issue is not complicated, it's black and white. It's small town righteous concerns versus pushy powerful state agendas. And what does it solve? It just pushes the traffic down to the next intersection of Anna Way and Posse Park and inconveniences about 1,500 citizens. That's how many people live in these neighborhoods. Um, I know you guys did a lot of work, but I really don't care about your models. We see what the traffic people can do, we've seen how it works well, and we see how it doesn't work well. And this time, we're not gonna be your guinea pigs. Like I said before, where are all the citizens of Newark who really, really want this, like we really, really don't want this? Is there anybody in here who wants this? No. Where are they? No. All good. no. Few people up there. Okay. Um, we don't want this. Uh, the the 2,000 people in our neighborhoods outweigh the seven people who really do want this, and that's Tom, Matt, Mark, Polly, Paul, and Stu. That's who. That's who, and that's who, who really cares about this. Uh, and guess what? They don't live in our neighborhood. None of them. None of them live in our neighborhood. So you want to look up there? I'm just thinking about it. Did they give me extra time? So up there, you can see that uh, I already cross. I ride my bike all the time downtown, probably about 15 times a week. And right now, I can cross down there by, at the intersection because I know that that one light is going to be red. And then I just tell those other people who are turning from Cleveland Avenue onto Library Avenue. 
towards McDonald's, I just tell them, I just put my hand up and say, stop, stop, because they're gonna come. And they see me and then I can go. If they just put a red light in there for those people turning from Cleveland Avenue onto Library Avenue, going towards the McDonald's, they're just sitting right there. That solves all those problems about those accidents. Just put a light there, say stop, and then when it's okay to go, give them a green light. When they're out of the traffic's going green, then they can go green. Otherwise, that'll solve all those problems. You won't have any accidents down there. Everything's done, has been really good since uh, Todd went and got those tur two uh, left turns going on to Figman Avenue, Avenue and the two turns coming out of Woodland. Everything's fine. We like it. We like it, and we're the ones that live here, and we don't have any problem with it. I don't even know why we're spending all this time for the last, we've been here four times now. Two council meetings tonight and a town meeting, and it's obvious that we don't like this. Uh, and you think it's great, and you think we're gonna get more traffic. We don't have a problem with the traffic. We don't mind. I go here, and I lived here 53 years, and I've been driving here, I got my license here, I got my, I did everything down here, and I live in Newark, and it's not a problem. All right, there's one thing that's obvious about this, and if you lived here like I have, like I just said, uh, you, you would have seen it. It's jockeying for position to get into the right, fast, non-stopping right lane, all the traffic from College Avenue, all the traffic from Newark High, all the traffic coming down Library Avenue from BJ's and Route 4, all the traffic from Maryland's Road and 273 and Main Street, and the hotel traffic, they're all gonna be trying to get into where? That right lane going straight up Kirkwood Highway. Already it's backed up. You can you imagine if there's only gonna be one lane, not two lanes going up Kirkwood Highway? There's only gonna be one. How are you gonna get over there? Oh my gosh, I gotta start thinking about this even before I come out of North High School. And I worked at North High School. I'm thinking, all right, how am I gonna get that right lane so I can get up there? So I gotta, I gotta jockey in with the people coming out of the, uh, the shopping center. And then all those other people. And they're all gonna be trying to get into that right lane so we can go all the way down and go down the Kirkwood Highway so we can go up. I don't know if it's gonna happen. It's already backed up there. And then the people coming in over there from uh, Marrow's Road and down 273. I don't know how it's gonna happen. They're all gonna be jammed up in there trying to get in that right lane. And then it's, what happens if it snows? Everybody's gonna be in that right lane and, and all these barriers are gonna block the snow and the snow's gonna come over top of the barrier and it's gonna get in the way and how are they gonna plow the, the snow over across both barriers? I don't know how they're gonna do that. It's just crazy. And it, that crosswalk, the only way you're going to be able to fix anybody to be able to do a crosswalk is if you get a crosswalk like they have up there by the YMC up at Kirkwood Highway. That's what they should have down there. A big crosswalk that can get everybody across. Dean, please talk to counsel. I'm sorry. Thank but, you. Thank you. All right, so um, anything else, anybody else want to add? While I'm up here? They're not permitted to do that, Dean. Please talk to counsel. All right. But I think I've got all my points. But I do appreciate you people. And I know you do it. You don't, you're tired, tired, uh, tiresome. And, and you don't get paid a lot of money, and I appreciate you being here, but these are our citizens, and we really don't want this, and it just seems silly to me, and it seems silly to everybody here, even though it's, you think it's gonna benefit Newark, it might benefit them, but you know, we've already made the sacrifice for us coming down there, we used to be able to take the two rights coming down Cleveland Avenue onto Kirkwood Highway, and we get in there really fast, and we'd be able to get through there, but now it's only one lane, so we have to, we, you know, we, we gave up the, um, we gave up that for you guys. So the people going up towards McDonald's and all the people coming down Paper Mill Road who want to go and get off and you know, go around 273 and, and get on to 95, they can go that way. So we did that. We did that. We made that sacrifice for you guys. Now we only have one lane turning left on the Kirkwood Highway. And now it's going to jam us up again. Now we're going to be, again, punished again with this Florida T. And I know you guys are mean well, but uh, this isn't for our neighborhoods and it's not for Newark. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you for your time, Council. Appreciate it. Thank you. You can just set that microphone right on that chair right there. That would be great. You follow direction, Dean. Do the students at Newark High School follow direction? <laughs> some do, some don't. Uh, yeah, you better check. Dick Daugherty, please. Is David Daugherty here? Thank you, sir. Good evening. I'm, good evening. My name is Dick Dart, and uh, I'm a resident of Windy Hills. I'm not a city of Newark resident, but uh, I've been trying to uh, keep an open mind through all this presentation and the, and the description of how it's all going to work. Um, you guys have done a great job presenting it, and thank you, Council, for su supplying this opportunity to us. But I think, uh, having heard a lot of uh, the comments tonight, I, it just makes me think: should you know, before you vote on this, you, 
you just got to do make a gut check. And does does it does it make any sense to to, to have this as the linchpin of the of the project to turn on to Cleveland Avenue that's going to become a one lane road and, and just beyond this image to to improve traffic. That just doesn't. I can't wrap my my mind around that. Um, the second thing is, and, and, and you're glazing over because you've heard a lot of these comments before, but again, you just gotta ask yourself, do a gut check. Does it, does it make sense to jeopardize the people that are leaving that new hotel right before that railroad bridge, pulling out in front of these tra the traffic coming towards Wilmington, and, and jeopardizing all the residents all the way up Capitol Trail? And, and does, it, does it make sense to, uh, to, 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 to have a, 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 an, a, a bus stop, and, and, and you know how aggressive these dark drivers are. They'll pull right out into that lane, and if those people that are in that lane coming down at 35, 40 miles an hour and up, they can't pull over because of that barricade, you're gonna have a lot, you're actually gonna have an increase in danger and safety issues. So um, again, before you vote, consider yourself um, uh, as, as, as a resident in this area that might be affected by some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jason Thomas, please. Jason at 392 Stafford. Yep. City Council, thank you all for giving us this opportunity to speak out against this. Um, not great plan. If we're talking about safety, then the safest thing, in my opinion, from someone that goes out this exit every single day, putting a light at a Cleveland Avenue that would say no turn on red when Windy Hills is coming out, and the same goes for basically opposing traffic, that's usually where these accidents occur from. Cutting us out from the whole area doesn't really help anyone that I can see. All of our property value is going to suffer and it's not really gonna be a big improvement on traffic by improving traffic flow by 100 seconds, which is a minute and 40 seconds. That's not that impressive, it's really not. Uh, finally, this will definitely speed up traffic, which would help move things along quicker, but as Del Dot stated, the way they're gonna prevent that from speeding up traffic too much is to create concrete barriers that would make Drivers very uncomfortable driving through there, so then they're likely not to speed. I don't know how making drivers deliberately uncomfortable is helping the safety of anyone involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. I'm now going to open it up to anybody that did not sign up that would like to share the comments. I will only request that people come to the podium and say something different. We've heard a lot of comments tonight. We're approaching two hours of public comment, which is fine. But if you, if you want to come and say something other than what's already been said, uh, please raise your hand. In the far back, gentlemen. Yep. Good evening, everybody. I am Alex Paglisi. I live at 134 Woodlawn, and uh, just a carrying on with everybody has said. I agree with all of it. It's a horrible idea. Uh, but if everybody thinks this is such a great idea, the traffic in Newark as a whole is horrible, so just put a Florida T everywhere. Yeah. Because from Woodlawn up to BJ's, during this time frame is a gridlock both ways. It's ridiculous that this is being considered as a solution to make flow go north considering the southbound going up towards Route 4. So it's a very poor, poor plan. Thank you. All right, thank you. Who else? Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Tom Laskowski, 131 Woodlawn Avenue. Uh, I, when we first came over, I guess back in March, and I was saying, why did they even start developing this plan? And it turns out it was a federal safety thing about the accidents. And they fixed that, that incident. Uh, I believe that our Del Dot representative said that they didn't initiate the idea of the, uh, the Florida T, but the uh, Cleveland Avenue group had. All right, well, this young lady that spoke was saying it, all, it had a lot to do with a crosswalk down here by the low income household. And 
for the life of me, I don't know why she had to use the moniker that she was with the NAACP, but now we're getting into being political correctness and a, a whole other li liberal issue and gentrification because we're a college town. I can't see that that's, that should have any kind of bearing when the decisions are made by the, the board over here because they could simply put a crosswalk right there at that, at that uh, housing development and everybody that works at on Automobile Road cross that street every day in their jobs. <laughs> Nobody's getting run over. So this whole idea of this Florida T, once again, I believe you said that the, the Cleveland Avenue group is the one who introduced the idea to them, and they're trying to reinforce it. And it's political push. It's a political push from that, from that sector of the, the city that's that seems to be the problem thank you for listening thank you thank you for being here tonight anybody else did anybody else raise their hand you see your time so you're you you did no second time is not permitted tonight third no anyone else you may you Bottom line is that we all know Adam Quay is an ice bucket during the winter. We need your name, sir. Oh, I apologize. Joseph McGinnis, 6 Orchard Avenue, Lumbrook. All I see here is we're taking fender bender accidents and moving them into a high speed accident. You're going to have this merger point here, which is like up in Marrows of New Jersey, and where cars just smash into each other. And I always call it you're at the gladiator arena. Because they're coming in, they're all trying to merge in one spot. You're going to have that as a crash zone, and you're going to have it as backing up the whole system. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going ahead and going to close it to public comment. I'll bring back to the table here. We will. Uh... Yep, we'll get a microphone first, and then we'll get started. We can go ahead and start with this one. Councilman Moorhead, you may begin again. I'd like to thank Del Dot for bringing information. I'd like to thank the public for coming out and involved. Um, I've said many times, we are your government, and that's how I feel. So um, thanks for telling us what you think. Um, are you asking for the roll call now? No, I'm not. Final You're just comments. just asking for discussion. Final comments. OK. Um, final comments. I have not been swayed from my earlier position. Councilman Clifton? Thank you. You know, I think there's been a lot of great points made here tonight. And I do feel that what has been, what is being suggested here uh, does put an undue burden on the neighborhood. Uh, we are a community. We're a community of people. We're a community of residents who love living in Newark. We have some of the greatest trails in this region going through the city of Newark. So we're a community that encourages walking and uh, getting out of their cars and, and so forth. Uh, but yet I look at just taking the issue of the crosswalks. I know what it's like being stranded on a traffic island. Uh, as many here at the table know, I'm in New York a lot. I know what it's like to be standing out in the middle of probably 30 mile per hour traffic, and it's not a great feeling. I darn sure don't want my grandkids to be doing that. And in order to make this work, you have to shorten the cross time. Federal standard, and I'll ask you this, Matt, federal standard is that the average person walks three feet every second, figuring an average pace of, of 24 to 30 inches, and the second leg's coming forward in that second time frame. So this is what, a 45, 50 feet wide intersection. I'm gonna take, uh, 
the, the uh, Kirkwood saw first. So to say that it's going to be, what, seven seconds and you're going, I mean, there's not even any doubt you're going to have to use the aisle. Oh, thank you. Uh, to me, that's so counterintuitive to making this a pedestrian-friendly community. And it does get worse down Alder Creek. Now you have children that are going to be standing in the middle there because they have no choice. Because to make this work, those cross, uh, it's the crosswalks designed for something less than what I see is that stand. So we have a slide on <clears throat> the pedestrian signal faces. This, this crosswalk here, just on counting the number of piano keys or markings, is roughly about 56 feet. So when you do the calculation for that, it's going to be 23, 24 seconds. Correct. Which is during that 23, 24 seconds that somebody is crossing from the Refuge Island over to Porter Chevrolet, the left-hand turn movement is going concurrently and not in conflict. So. During peak times, we will definitely provide 23 seconds to cross from here to here, and at the same time, it will simultaneously serve the double left. The short crosswalk here from the Refuge Island over to the corner, that is not substandard. That is the time to cross 16 feet. I mean, it's, it's four seconds. It's five seconds at most at three and a half feet per second, and we're going to provide 14 seconds. Where, where was that again, Matt? That's to cross from the Refuge Island over to the corner. So that's the 16 seconds. I mean, the, the same can be said about the current situation with the crosswalk now and how that operates and that distance. There, there is no refuge island, so you kind of get hung out to dry. But you're right, there are different ways to look at that crosswalk and how the orientation, I mean, it, it's something that we've considered. This is not set in stone from a concept standpoint, but separating these two movements, it provides a refuge, it shortens up the time <clears throat> so that the continuous green is provided as much green time throughout the hour as you know as it needs to clear the traffic but the we are providing three and a half feet per second and beyond in terms of both of these crosswalks and then this one here will obviously operate with the inbound southbound movement and that would also get in excess of three and a half feet per second but Say it again. When you say that, I I get I kind of gleaned from what you're saying is that the anticipation of stranding someone at the island is is a reality that 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 is going to happen. You're saying it's less time for the continuous green because in fact it is continuous. You go to the island and then you continue crossing. So. When you, when you reach the island, if you're crossing, in this case, from the bottom of figure to the top of figure, mm -hmm. you would stand on this corner, you would wait until the green stops, you would cross to the refuge island. When you get to the refuge island, you would press that button, and then when you would be served is when the left turn's going at the same time. So is there a potential in the signal cycle where you will be on the refuge island? Yes, but that's not, that's not inconsistent with you know, other refuge islands that we have along the corridor you can go back to 273. This is a refuge island. There's traffic on you know, all sorts of legs. So, I mean, we tried to, in the concept, what we did was we tried to maximize the square footage that you have around you. So that's something that we could look at to make pedestrians more comfortable. The general rule of thumb is if you have six feet of concrete around you, then you know, ADA and, and traffic standards indicate that that's a acceptable refuge area. So we're providing an excess, easily an excess of six feet here. Um, but that is the thing when you go into final design, that if that's a, a sticking point for people and people feel uncomfortable about that, then you make this turn to come into kind of the throat of that. You make it a little bit more steep or a little bit more shallow to provide even more concrete there. I mean, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you mentioned precedent. Uh, by mentioning 273 at well, Harmony Road, correct? Uh, so I'm glad you brought up the uh, precedent. The same pictures that you have, that you have shown in your earlier slides, come from Colorado. 
I found one in Colorado. I found one in, I think, Arizona and so forth. Uh, what do you see there? You know, I see kind of like the wide open spaces. Uh, uh, you know, uh, not a resident in sight. And I think, I think uh, unless something has changed, the last time you and I talked, uh, you can't give me an example of precedent of any place this has been used that has closed off a development or even a shopping center. Cor correct. Excuse me. Not proper decorum. Please let them continue. Uh, You're uh, correct. I, I, I don't have a good example of this situation and this context and you know, the residential aspects, the downstream driveways and everything else. And that's something that when we talk about the concept and talk about listening to various concerns and constructively digesting this information, it is, it's not something that we just disregard it and say, you know what, we're sticking with this example. This was, are there case studies out there about green teas, Florida teas? To answer that question, yes, there are. But the moral of the story and what I tried to convey to the group tonight is that when we're talking about traffic, when we're talking about geometrics, we're talking about intersections in general, you have to approach each one objectively and look at the context of that intersection. Here, the kind of the, the elephant in the room is the other traffic signal that serves that neighborhood. So that's different than what's obviously in Colorado. If there was a neighborhood on the other side of these mountains and they had another signal down the road, then that's something that we could consider. A comparable condition that we just talked about through the task force and that went to council several months ago is Margaret Street. It's a five-legged intersection. We problem solved that. We took a five-legged intersection yeah. that requires the same number, the same 12 seconds each signal cycle, just like Woodlawn. And what did we decide? And you decided as well. The state, the city, we all said this makes sense. Then locate, send that traffic. And it's a traffic signal down at Timothy's that we're trying to expedite as quickly as possible so that we can free up the capacity at the five-legged intersection. That's the comparison. That's the analogy. That's a similar situation where we took residential, other usage, and said, you know what? There's some redundancy here. We have a problem. Let's look at how we can better utilize that redundancy. Yeah, and I would submit to you the difference is a lot of the students that live there, and they're mostly all students, probably walk to class. The people that live in these neighborhoods actually drive to go to work. Uh, and I think that's a fundamental difference in all respect to you. Uh, you were there, what, last week, week before, when you kindly gave more, more hours than you thought you were going to give up uh, to talk to one of the neighbors. The neighbor asked that we could have a police officer out there. And he clocked the traffic for about 20 minutes. And Bill was talking about the 71 miles per hour. I know that's a fact because I know the person that was involved in that. It's been years ago, but it was 71 miles per hour along there. Uh, while we were there, and I'm sure you remember, the lowest speed was 33. The average was 38 or 39. And where we were standing, you weren't even at the crest of the hill or the turn. We were on the upside of that. Uh, high was 45 miles per hour. Before we even got to the crest of the hill, will, will, will the, the construction of this make slow people down? Um, I would submit to you, if it does, just like Harmony Road, it's temporary. It's temporary to people figure it out. And, and in this case, it probably will take less time than Harmony Road. I have friends at the Long Harmony Road, uh, so they could speak a little better for this. But the, I think the most telling thing that was said, you talked about the driveways, and what was the term random brakes? Am I correct in that? Was that the term that was used? So, I, I will choose my terms carefully and not completely geek out. It's, all, it's obviously a late night. So right now, several of you, I will acknowledge wholeheartedly that you have a predictable gap in traffic. 
ever since May 2015, you know, you can see the back of the platoon come through and go, you know what? There's my safety valve. I can come out of the driveway. And I, I will not dispute that. I'm not here to argue things that are very obvious. And you know, Michael, we had a good conversation about this as well. But the, the end result from a projection standpoint, a simulation standpoint, and just crunching the data is, uh, the data is that we will be back to a random arrival type of scenario that was present prior to May of 2015 where you don't know, because we don't have the, you know, the halt of traffic for 40, 50 seconds, it's not as predictable as it is presently. So what we relied on and in, in processing that information, we said, okay, we're now stepping backwards from a driveway gap standpoint. We, when we made that change in May, it was better for certain aspects downstream. So then we looked at the crash data that corresponded with that pre-2015 condition. And right now, based on the information that was reported, there weren't these glaring red flags that stood out. And then the numbers in themselves from a gap standpoint, although you're going from a more predictable random event to a really random event, the numbers aren't exponentially worse. They're comparable to what they were. So it's, it's not minutes of delay. And you know the, the boat example, I'm, I'm sorry who said that, but you know, the time gap that's required for a boat and to back in and everything else, you can't see that far down the road. So you don't know how long that gap is. You don't know when to accept that gap and to go, all right, I have enough time to back in my boat. So those are the things we processed kind of on the fly and said, you know what, it, these numbers make sense to a certain extent and we're gonna trust the math, we're gonna trust the simulation, we're gonna trust the science and we're gonna rely on, okay, what, what were the safety impacts prior to that? So that was the thought process that we went through on the, the driveway gaps. Yeah, I guess the, just the term random, I kind of interpreted it right wrong as good luck with that. D Dean, uh, uh, Dean, are you a stats guy? I mean, do you, it's, it's, it's a Poisson arrival. So it's a, it's from a statistic standpoint, it is literally you know, a random event. We don't know when you're gonna leave your house, hop in your car and drive down the driveway. It's a Poisson arrival, it's the same. It, if it's, if it was a generator, a, a, a factory that had shift work, that's not random. This is, we don't know when this gentleman here is gonna leave his driveway. And, and that's, the, it's not random in that we don't have control over it, it's just statistically and mathematically. It's a random event that's rather infrequent, definitely. You know, we trust the numbers that gaps will be there and they'll be comparable to what it was before we switched the sequ signal sequence. Well, one thing that I can say proudly that no one else at your table or even at this table can say, I lived at Stafford for 15 years. I came up and down and away. I've seen the backups as it exists. And I don't know if the gentleman that spoke earlier from Gilberty Lane lives at the house that's right at the jug handle, but I don't think I would want to live there. Like it was said earlier, I buy a house based on what I see at that moment in time, knowing that there are other, other events that can affect the quality of life. Uh, I wouldn't expect my government to be the curator of the chain of my quality of life. I bought, by, I bought there because it was easily accessible uh, and partially because when it did ice and snow, like it's been said, I was another one of the ones that went out on uh, Woodlawn. Uh, I have a lot of concerns what that is going to look like when you have that many people, especially if we can't get to it quick enough, and Tom's Public Works, uh, and the snow and so forth gets packed down before we can clear it. Uh, it's, it's bad enough as it is that people maybe have to go out that way, uh, but uh, I don't think that increasing the traffic to that point is, is, uh, is one of the reasons. I just think, uh, I think this is a case of uh, diminishing returns. You've said that the accident numbers are down. You've provided what I know is qualifiable data for that. 
with the exception of coming out of Woodlawn Avenue, with that exception. And as I said earlier, I think that that maybe is maybe tweaking the signalization coming off Cleveland Avenue. Uh, but uh, I get what these people are saying. And as I said earlier, we're a community of people and they hired me for a reason. They hired me to represent their best interest. And uh, I understand what they're saying. And I just think that this is a case that, you know, you've gotten a lot of the problems solved. You've gotten uh, the accident occurrence down. Is it going to go to zero? No, it's not going to go to zero ever. I'd like to see it do that, but that's not even realistic. Uh, Cleveland Avenue hasn't changed. We don't know the impact of Cleveland Avenue as it's been said by a couple of council members. I just think that uh, uh, if we're going to have this discussion, we need to see what the overall impact is and look at it for, you know, in a little bit more holistic picture after other changes. And we're a community. We're not an interstate that goes to the Hunt Levere's or up in Hocassin. Uh, we are we are a community, and to to make matters worse and to cre and create. And I'm going to tell you, I think that the speeds are going to be higher. Uh, to make matters what I see as unsafe is going beyond the point of diminishing returns. Yep. Wallace. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Hamilton. Thank you. Um, numbers can, can talk about a lot when we talk about 3,000 people going, 20,000 people going through the intersections. My challenge with this is we have a neighborhood. There are people from Newark. They live here, work here, shop here. They've already given up in a previous change, the two lane, lane turns. I miss that turn. I drive to my mother's who lives on Kirkwood Highway. I find this intersection frustrating. Sometimes I'll go up Mill Road to avoid this intersection. I get it that there's a problem, but we're gonna continue to act this neighborhood to take on that burden. Um, I, I don't, I can't do that. I can't. For the reasons that they said, and for my own conscience. Today I did a little exercise, mental gymnastics. Thought, geez, what if my neighborhood lost all its entrances along South College? And just, hey, let's shut off all the exits except for one on South College then increase the speed on South College to 40 miles per hour. I, my neighborhood would be up in arms about this. There's got to be a better way to solve this. And I appreciate the work that everybody's done. Um, to me, there are two issues, and I'll get to the second one in a minute. Uh, they, they just told you they will shut off their exit from 4 to 6 p.m. How much does that cost to do that? Sending somebody out there and switching a light. We're gonna spend half a million dollars to put something in place. We don't even know if it's gonna work. These folks are giving us suggestions. Let's listen to them. If it achieves the same thing, great. Um, I drove through your neighborhood today. That hill on Anna Way, I, I never noticed it. I heard people saying, ooh, it's a hill. It's going to be you know, slippery and, and icy. And I thought, yeah, right. Because you just can't see from Kirkwood Highway what it is. But sure as heck, when I started down a hill, I used to spend winters up in New England. That is going to be a dangerous hill. And they can say, the city can say, ooh, we're going to plow it right away. That's not going to matter. That is not going to matter. You have a flat entrance. 
going out Woodlawn Avenue, that's where I would go if I had a child. I've got my son's 13, he's gonna be driving in a few years. I would never, hey, on an icy day, get ahead out of Anaway. Not gonna work, not unless I wanna pay a lot in insurance. Um, thank you for coming out. I, I appreciate everybody's point of view in this, and you know, look, we got elected to serve you folks. I'm in a different district, I get that. But if people start tearing, tearing us apart by district piecemeal, yeah. we lose Newark as a community as a whole. Um, so folks might not vote for me. If you do, there's gonna be a question somehow. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, but um, I have to do what's right here in this particular intersection. And to take that away from you folks, I don't think is the right thing. And you think Councilman Hamilton? Oh, one more thing. However, I think it's imperative that we give options for transportation in this city. So, yeah, I, council has put in or approved a crosswalk. You know, for anybody that speaks and dismisses the low income housing on um, Cleveland Avenue. They are people too. They need to get out of their neighborhood city just like you want to. Different way, but they're people too. We have to take care of them, so we gotta figure this out. That's why I asked earlier if we can decouple this. Um, somehow we got to get it done. I, we had put in a crosswalk, proved it. Um, things changed, thought it came back. But we're going to take care of that. But we're going to also take care of you. There's a way to do it both ways. We're going to figure out how to do it. Thank you. Councilman Chapman. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who's here and has participated in this multi project. Uh, there was a comment made and so on record I want to make a comment that uh, for folks out there that believe that counselors come to meetings, their minds made up and your participation doesn't matter, you're wrong. Thank you for being here and thank you for participating and Hopefully you can share that message with the people who feel or felt that way. Um, this project, like many other proposals in front of us, I first asked, why should we do this? As a representative of District 5, that very easy question to answer because it makes my life easier. It makes the residents of District 5 lives easier. One of the top three things that District 5 has complained to me about, as long as I've been interested in participating in City Council, is ingress and egress to our side of town out, especially during rush hours. So then I ask, why should we not do something? That was less easy. I'm biased to protecting District 5 and my own commute. However, through your participation, not just tonight, but in the entire process, voicing opinions and sharing ideas, concerns, and your true experience, it's very enlightening, gives us perspective. Um, I do believe that the effort put into the analytics and the troubleshooting and modifications to the proposal have addressed many of the concerns that are still out there. And I just happen to have a natural disposition to trust the experts more often than not. Is it perfect? No. Are they always right? No. Um, in a few times in the past few years, there's been instances where I ask the rest of council to think about the greater good 
and not just say no to something that has the greatest impact to just five because it might cost money but not direct district on the other side of town. And so I put myself in that position tonight thinking about this town, this city as a whole, and the residents who live in it. I do believe that the Florida Tea, in combination with all of the other Cleveland Avenue improvements, would have been incredibly innovative and improved traffic flow for the greatest good. Representative Bob Bach referenced 96%. That's hard to ignore, but I've always thought about hard decisions in ways. The greatest good. And to do or not to do something at all costs. The data center was something that didn't seem to make sense at all. I only reference that because it was so confrontational. The crosswalk situation for Alder Creek is serious and it needs to be addressed. We will. I am that commuter taking Cleveland Avenue, turning right on Capitol Trail in the morning. I get mad at the people turning right in front of you coming out to make the left-hand turn. It seems easy enough if this does not get approved tonight for us to come back and to Del Dot to apply a red arrow. When you have the green, but I'll tell you, it being a no turn on right, or no right turn on red entirely, will have an incredibly detrimental effect. So that too, we have to find the balance. Those are my comments. Councilman Markham. Thank you, Your Honor. So lots of emotion in the room tonight. Um, Lots to listen to, and I really the words. So, um, just some things. Uh, I guess I'm not supposed to talk tonight. Um, a lot of work has gone into this, and I think there's still more that could be done. But you know, to vote against this, and I'm not saying which I'm gonna do. There's task force, there's Del Dot, there's the traffic, there's police, there's Aetna, um, and frankly, my district. Um, but, because they're looking for relief, and don't have uh, the traffic light to exit the two, but they're looking to purchase. Okay, looking for help. I'm sorry? Uh, I don't think I would come out based on <laughs> the, the, the attitude in the room. So anyway, Dean, that, so, but my point is they're not looking to hurt you, they're looking for relief. And if you look at the even the new task force recommendations that have already been put in place to help the rest of the city, they are all in sense. They have already taken parking, the traffic's going away, the lanes are shrinking. They're all in District 6. So they kind of feel a little put upon too. So three, three and a half years, right guys? Before this would affect? So, I still like to look at a time of day, some type of eating system, it reflects in my mind, because that would provide the most benefit to the most people and hurt the least number of people. As for the sidewalk, I seem to remember that Cleveland Tax Force had an alternate suggestion should the Florida team not go through. Do we have that available for discussion tonight? 
we don't have slides, unfortunately, and we apologize for not having slides on that. I mean, the, the information about Alders Creek and that crosswalk is on the website for, for, you know, for the task force as a whole, but the general consensus there was that if the Florida T does not go through, then we're going to have more of a queuing problem on Cleveland Avenue. So the investigation will be to find a way to relocate or mark the crosswalk farther west on the corridor and use a warning treatment as opposed to the hawk. Right, so move it further west. And so that, that was, yeah, that was already approved. Um, and, the, and actually, when you look at the neighborhood, Alder Creek neighborhood, most of the housing is actually on the western side. Um, there's only a, the clubhouse that, towards the entrance uh, to McKee's Lane. So if you can make the grid work, you can bring a sidewalk directly out of the housing section to, to Franklin Avenue. The, the issue with doing the, uh, the hawk signal, the intersection without the floor T is that there's no, because of the intersection um, delays, we'll have to carry the double turn lanes past where that refuge island would be. So there would be a refuge island. So you'd either have to walk the whole way across uh, the street with no protection. Um, it really, that's the only option. Or, or take two lanes out to put the, the refuge island in. So that, that, that's why the, the hawk signal at the intersection was tied to the floor. Okay. I just remembered that there was an alternative. So anyway, back to point which I made earlier at this it's going to find it. three, three and a half years I will modify this to hurt the least number of people but still help the most number of people. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, you're welcome. Uh, I will uh, now uh, entertain counsel either making a motion regarding the Florida T or giving di direction to staff. Council Clifton, this is primarily in your district. Would you like to entertain a motion, please? For the record, when a motion is made, a motion, I believe, is made in the affirmative. That is correct. So you can't make a motion in the negative to not approve something because it gets too confusing. So for that reason, I will make the motion to approve the uh, Florida tea. Please be quiet. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. I will entertain a second, please. Second. Second is Councilman Wallace. We will take a roll call vote, please, beginning with Councilman Moorhead. One. Please just state yes or no. We don't need a reason this evening. No. No. Councilman Clifton's a no. Councilwoman Wallace. Yes. Councilman Hamilton? No. No. Councilman Chapman? No. Councilman Markham? Yes. And Mayor Sear is a no. Motion fails. All right. Just a couple closing remarks. Uh, thanks to DelDoc for all their work on this. They spent far more time on this project than they do on other projects besides. And thank you to all of the public who has shown up. I know we received a lot of emails and phone calls and text messages regarding this project. And we certainly want an engaged community and we are glad that you did so. And thank you to council for uh, their comments and discussion tonight, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.